Kere, visitor. You are about to embark on a journey of discovery through the rich and fascinating history of classical Greece. You'll become fully immersed in the painstakingly detailed world built for Assassin's Creed Odyssey, which you are free to explore at your own pace, without any danger or time pressure. For a directed experience, take one of the many guided tours curated by prominent historians and archaeologists. Along the way, exchange words with some of Greece's most famous historical persons. The classical Greece you are about to explore is at the peak of its glory. This period is synonymous with grand accomplishments of the physical and the mental. Architectural marvels which still stand today dot its landscape while towering achievements in philosophy, political systems, and art still influence our modern society in profound ways. We hope you become engrossed in the dazzling riches of ancient Greece and welcome you to your visit. Anemon Diokis, o anthrope! Greetings, Wanderer, and welcome to the Acropolis, the shining jewel of Athens. My name is Aspasia. Though I am not originally from Athens, I have climbed to the top of its social ladder using my wit and intellect. I've even earned the love of Pericles, one of the most powerful men in the city. The mind truly is a beautiful thing. Personally, I think the Acropolis is one of, if not the, greatest place in all of Greece. Though, considering it was the project of my partner, Pericles, I may be a touch biased. The Acropolis of Athens is a bastion of art and culture worthy of the gods themselves. Within this citadel, you will find many important sacred buildings, as well as some of the most magnificent art in all of Greece. You are in for a very enlightening visit. When you're done, come find me, and we can discuss the things you have seen. Farewell for now. The Acropolis has gone through many changes in its long history. It began as a simple rock, was settled as early as the Neolithic period, and then became a fortress in the Mycenaean period. Stone buildings started appearing in the 7th century BCE, but the famous structures whose ruins remain visible today date mainly from a period of construction in the 5th century BCE. The location of the Acropolis is closely tied with Athens' foundation myth. Supposedly, it was the site where Athena and Poseidon competed for the city's patronage. This connection gave the Acropolis a sacred aura, and it was considered the religious heart of the city. The Acropolis, a stone building started appearing.
in the 7th century BCE. The location of the Acropolis. The Temple of Athena Nike was built on the remains of old fortifications from the Mycenaean era. Worship at the temple can be traced back to the 6th century BCE, but the building itself was destroyed during the Greco-Persian Wars a century later. It was rebuilt during the Peloponnesian War. Given that the name Athena Nike roughly means Athena of Victory, it was likely constructed in the hopes that Athens would win the war. Unusually, the temple depicts historical scenes of battles against the Persians instead of the more mythologically inclined art of other Greek buildings. The temple's priestess was chosen randomly among the Athenians and received a salary of 50 drachmae annually, along with skins and trophies from sacrificed animals. The Acropolis was built up over a long period, due in no small part to its partial destruction during the Greco-Persian Wars. It was in the 5th century BCE, though, that the Acropolis received its most significant improvements. This period was an extremely prosperous time for Athens, both financially and culturally. With a booming economy bolstered by trade and the Lavrion silver mines, Pericles, the leader of Athens, financed a huge project to rebuild the citadel. He enlisted the help of renowned artists like the sculptor Phidias, as well as the architects Ictinos and Callicrates. Together, they erected buildings like the Parthenon and the Propylia Gateway. Pericles' goal was to make the Acropolis into a glorious monument to the gods and to mortal Athenians. Behind the Propylia was the giant bronze statue of Athena Promachos, or Athena who fights on the front lines. That name was reflected in the spear and shield the statue held in its hands. It was erected in the mid-5th century BCE by the artist Phidias. According to an inscription, it took nine years to make and cost almost half a million drachmae. At approximately 10 meters tall, the statue was apparently so large that Pausanias claimed its helmet and spear tip could be seen from the sea near Cape Sunion, 60 kilometers away. The ornamentation on the statue's shield was engraved by the metalsmith, Mies.
The Araforoi were young girls between the ages of 7 and 11 who were in charge of special rights. A list of four girls was drafted by the Assembly of Citizens, from which the High Magistrate, the Archon Basileus, chose two to serve as Araforoi for the year. The girls lived in a house on the Acropolis. They were in charge of carrying sacred objects and weaving the peplos of Athena. The peplos was a sacred robe offered to Athena during Panathenea, a festival held in her honor. The Erechtheion was an atypical temple. It was dedicated not only to Athena Pelias, but also to Kekrops, the mythical founder of Athens, his son Erechtheos, and even Poseidon, the sea god who challenged Athena for possession of the city. The temple was divided into sections. The eastern part housed a statue dedicated to Athena, while the western section jointly belonged to Poseidon and Erechtheos. Meanwhile, King Kekrop's grave was believed to be under the caryatid porch. Under the temple was a crypt that was said to contain the sacred snakes of Athena. The snakes may have had a sweet tooth because the priestesses of Athena allegedly fed them honey cakes.
The Parthenon is one of the most well-known buildings in the world and an enduring symbol of ancient Greek civilization. While it is located on the Acropolis, the building is not a traditional temple. It was built by the sculptor Phidias and the architects Callicrates and Ictinus as a great monument to the glory of the city of Athens. That glory is evident in its many carvings. One of the most carved monuments in Greek architecture, the Parthenon's decorations depict several mythological scenes. These include the birth of Athena, her fight against Poseidon for the patronage of Athens, the gods' battle with the giants, and the procession of the great Panathenaea. The Parthenon's inner chamber, or cella, contained a massive statue of Athena that was considered to be one of the sculptor Phidias's greatest masterpieces. The statue was chryselephantine, a combination of gold and ivory. To justify the steep cost of its construction, Pericles told Athenians that the statue was a gold reserve which could be disassembled in times of economic distress. The cella also allegedly contained a pool whose main purpose was to control the room's humidity, which helped preserve the statue's ivory. The Parthenon's inner chamber. Or cella, this to just the cell. Athens' treasury was located in the Parthenon, where it was believed to be protected by Athena herself. The treasury contained objects of great value, acquired from different conquests, as well as a mass of minted silver coins and various offerings to Athena. Pericles also decided to move the entirety of the Delian League's treasure to the Parthenon in 454 BCE. This was a great testament to Athens' power over the rest of Greece. The riches were divided into two parts, the Demosia, which belonged to the city, and the Hiera Cremita, which was dedicated to the goddess and only used for religious purposes. And what did you think of the Acropolis? It truly is quite something, isn't it? A sacred sanctuary and an 
architectural marvel, all in one. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask. You're confident enough for a test? Very well. Let us see how much you know. Which two gods competed for Athens's patronage? Correct. It was Poseidon and Athena who fought for Athens's patronage. As for who won, the answer is in the city's name. On to the next question. Who sculpted the statue of Athena in the Parthenon? Praxiteles sculpted a marble statue of Artemis that stood in the Vravronion. Try again. Correct! The renowned sculptor Phidias made the statue, which was considered one of his masterpieces. And now, the final question. Which king's tomb was believed to be under the Caryatid porch? That is correct. Cecrops was the mythological first king of Athens, and his tomb was said to be under the Erechtheion. It seems you know much about this place. Well done, Wanderer. As you wish. Hopefully we will see each other again soon.
Welcome to Athens, Wanderer. More specifically, welcome to the musical hub of the city, the Odeon. Sometimes, when the burdens of life begin to weigh heavy on my shoulders, I come here, close my eyes, and surrender myself to the music. It makes me feel like I'm a child again. My mother singing me to sleep with a gentle lullaby. The Odeon was where musicians came to share their songs with the public. The melodies played here caught the wind and drifted through the air, soothing the souls of Athenians across the city. Come find me when your visit is complete, and we will talk about the things you've learned. See you soon, Wanderer. Music played an important part in almost every aspect of ancient Greek life. Whether attending a public gathering, rubbing elbows at a dinner party, laying out offerings in a temple, or marching into battle, there was a song for everything. Aristotle even wrote that music increased the efficiency of laborers, and it was often played for rowers and field pickers to keep them working at a steady rhythm. Musical contests, or agones, were originally only held during religious festivals. Over time, they became cultural events in their own right and attracted musicians and spectators from all over the Greek world. For example, the Athenian Panathenaea Festival featured competitions for instrument playing and poetry recitation. The Dionysia Festival included contests between groups of male singers to see who could best perform a dithyram, a merry hymn in honor of the god Dionysus. While these contests could be attended by all, women weren't allowed to compete in them. In the early days of the competitions, winners only received a crown and an ego boost for their talents. But from the Hellenistic period onward, the rewards were upgraded to cash prizes. 
These prizes were large enough for musicians to make a fortune, especially if they moved from festival to festival. The Odeon of Pericles was built sometime between the 440s and 430s BCE. The building was commissioned by Pericles for use in the Panathenaea festival. The Odeon was also a venue for poetry readings, political rallies, and philosophical performances. According to ancient sources, the original design of the Odeon was inspired by the tent of the Persian king Xerxes, a spoil of war the Athenians salvaged after their decisive victory at Salamis in 480 BCE. The building's roof was made of timber from captured Persian ships. In this sense, the Odeon was both a triumphant symbol of Athens and an insult to their Persian enemies. This structure was considered one of the grandest architectural accomplishments of ancient Athens. In ancient Greece, there was a type of music for almost any occasion. Complicated songs like hymns, paeans, and dithyrams were meant for the ears of the gods, and as such were usually played during religious ceremonies and civic life. Meanwhile, a hymenaeus was a song performed at weddings, and a threnody accompanied funeral processions. For more merry occasions like symposia, scolia were the soundtrack of choice. However, drama was considered the epitome of artistic expression, since it combined songs with poetry, dance, acting, and costumes. Plays were thought to be the connection between mortals and gods, and the songs that accompanied them, especially those from the tragedies of Euripides, often became huge hits in the rest of Greece. Hello again. I trust your visit was worthwhile, and that learning of music was a feast for your mind. I know it was for mine. Is there anything else you'd like to do? Fancy yourself an expert on music? Then let's put your knowledge to the test. Which of the following songs was played at weddings? Trinovias were funeral dirges. They were unlikely to be played at weddings, unless the musicians had a morbid sense of humor. Try another answer. It's true that the Thiramvi were on the merrier side, but they were sung in honor of the Onisos, not newlyweds. Try again. Correct. A Imeneos was performed at weddings to wish the couple a happy and prosperous union. Let's move on to the second question. The Odeon of Pericles was modeled after spoils of war from which Athenian enemy? Correct. 
Not only was the design based on the tent of the Persian king Xerxes, but the building's roof was made of wood from captured Persian ships. Only one question remains. According to Aristotle, music was especially important to which group of people? You are correct. Aristotle believed music improved certain motor skills, so it was played for field pickers and rowers to increase their work output. You definitely have an ear for music, Wanderer. I applaud you. Farewell, Wanderer. I hope you enjoyed the sweet sounds of the Odeon. Welcome, Wanderer, to one of the most prestigious places in Greece, the theater. I'd tell you, but I think it's best to let the actors speak for themselves. The theater was where audiences gathered to watch plays. They were the highest form of art in Greece, and people saw theater as a symbol of complete harmony between the mortal world and the divine. When you're done taking in the sights and sounds, come see me, and we'll talk more. Until then, Wanderer. Theater is not just part of geek culture, but was a major part of Greek culture. In Athens, comedies and dramas originated from the dancing and singing performed by members of the cult of Dionysus. Between 536 and 533 BCE, theater's burgeoning importance in Athens was demonstrated when the responsibility of organizing tragedies was entrusted to the Archon, the highest ranking magistrate in the city. From then on, theater grew rapidly in popularity and soon a permanent space for performing and watching plays was built on the slope of the Acropolis. During the 5th century BCE, theater became intertwined with Athens' democracy. It often functioned as an echo chamber for political ideas, and in some cases, it could even influence public opinion. As a result, in the 4th century BCE, Plato coined the term theatrocracy to describe his city's politics. Ah! <sighs> 
Theatrical competitions were held in the sanctuary of Dionysus Eleutherius, god of wine and patron of drama. Dionysus was the son of Zeus and a mortal woman named Semele. Stories say that Zeus, who had fallen in love with Semele, appeared to her holding a lightning bolt in his hand. Semele was tragically struck dead by the lightning, but Zeus managed to save her unborn child, keeping the embryo in his thigh until it fully gestated. This is why the name Dionysus is sometimes thought to mean born twice. In Athens, theater was a part of the cult of Dionysus, and stage productions in the gods' honor were held during festivals like the Linnea and the great Dionysia. In Athens, there were three festivals that honored Dionysus with drama performances. The Rustic Dionysias, the Linnea, and the Great Dionysia. For the Rustic Dionysia, each demi of Attica organized their own Dionysiac procession. The parades were full of phallic songs, dances, and symbols meant to signify fertility. And participants wore drunkard masks and sang body lyrics about the god. The Linnea was the oldest Dionysian festival. It was exclusively reserved for Greek citizens and mostly made up of comedy performances. Finally, the Great Dionysia was the most important festival. Taking place over several days, it began with a parade called a phallophori, followed by a dithyram contest and ending with consecrated drama competitions. Great Dionysia was supervised by the head magistrate known as the Archon, who was assisted by 12 other magistrates. Among his duties, the Archon picked Korigoi, rich Athenian citizens responsible for providing the budget for rehearsals and performances. Two days before the Dionysia, a ceremony called the Proagon took place where playwrights introduced their work. The Dionysia finally began in earnest with a procession to the god's temple, followed by sacrifices and a symposium. The next two days centered on dithyram contests, while the final four days were dedicated to drama competitions. The contest's outcomes were decided by ten judges who were appointed at random by the Archon. The judges placed their votes in an urn, and five of the votes were randomly picked to determine the winner. All Athenian stage actors were male, regardless of whether they were playing men or women. Tragedies originally featured only one actor performing alongside a chorus, eventually reaching a maximum of four. Adding more roles opened up the opportunity for dramatic dialogue. During performances, they prepared themselves in the skene, a building that served as a backstage area before emerging onto the proskenion, or stage. The skene could be painted to represent backdrops like palaces, temples, and tombs. Its roof was reserved for appearances by the gods. These gods could be moved around with a crane called a makane, which produced spectacular visual effects. On stage, actors wore masks and elaborate costumes. For tragedies, they were adorned with magnificent clothes. While for comedies, 
Actors playing male characters wore hugely exaggerated phalluses, probably to maximize the laughs. The centerpiece of the theater was the orchestra, or dancing place. It was a large, circular area that hosted choral performances, religious rites, and presumably, acting. Choruses were composed of men wearing masks and costumes. Any Athenian citizen could be choratai, as long as they were selected by the chorus director. Chorus members also served as the equivalent of a curtain as their entrance and exit marked the beginning and end of the play. New costumes and masks were produced for the chorus for every new play, and they were often just as impressive and elaborate as the performances. For example, Aristophanes' comedies feature the chorus dressing as wasps, frogs, birds, clouds, and islands. One of his plays, The Knights, even had men riding other men dressed as horses. Athens Theatron, or performance space, could seat up to 17,000 people, nearly a tenth of the population of Attica. Its excellent acoustics made it ideal for drama, but it was also sometimes used for political meetings and parades. The theater was accessible to everybody. This did not mean that seating was free, though. The first rows were normally where priests and public officials sat while the central part of the auditorium was reserved for ambassadors and guests of honor. There is also evidence that men and women sat separately. In general, theater audiences were emotional and noisy. During performances, they would shout, curse, and throw things depending on their mood, and their reactions were just as much a part of the experience as the acting. Hello again, Wanderer. I hope your visit was entertaining. Though all art forms were important in Greek culture, none had the same prestige as theater, which provided a unique experience with every performance. Is there anything else you'd like to do? Really? Then let's begin. Who was Dionysos' mother? Correct! Unfortunately, Semele died before her son was born, but Zeus saved the unborn baby and raised him as a god. Next, another question. Which competitions took place on the second and third days of the great Dionysia? No, the drama contests were reserved for the final four days of the festival, Try again. Yes, the Thiramvi were hymns dedicated to Dionysos, and the Thirambos contests were held on the second and third days of the festival. And finally, the last question. Which of the following is the oldest festival dedicated to Dionysos? The great Dionysia was one of the largest festivals dedicated to the god, but not the oldest. Try a different answer. You are correct. The Linia was the oldest Dionysiac festival. Congratulations, Wanderer. You're a very studious theater goer. Then I will leave you be. Farewell, Wanderer.
Welcome to the Gymnasium of the Kinosaries, one of the many places where philosophers came to enrich the mind and enlighten the spirit. There is no better setting for learning than in a quiet place far away from the commotion of the city. Education held a very important place in Greek society. The most prominent educators were philosophers, whose teachings ranged from everyday rituals to the makeup of the universe. Once your tour is complete, come find me, and we can discuss what you've learned. Farewell for now, wanderer. Philosophy comes from the Greek word philosophia, or love of wisdom. This concept was in direct contrast with philochromatia, love of money, and philotemia, love of honor. As of the second half of the 5th century BCE, Athens was known as Greece's capital of philosophy. Due to the rise of democracy, there was an increasing need for education beyond the basic subjects of elementary school. Athenian citizens needed to be able to participate in various functions of the democratic state, such as being elected for office, proposing new laws, engaging in military decisions, or simply defending their rights. Originally, Athens had no official school buildings for higher education. Sophists and philosophers taught either in private homes or in public spaces like the theater. To recruit young pupils for long-term curricula, they also held classes in gymnasia, where young Athenians underwent physical training. The Sinosarges was a sanctuary to Heracles, located in the south suburb of Athens. At the beginning of the 4th century BCE, Antisthenes used this sanctuary as a teaching spot for his school of philosophy, the aptly named Cynicism. Any free citizen was allowed to involve themselves in the Athenian democratic process. However, to truly influence the flow of politics, their speech and rhetoric skills had to be impeccable. As a result, many sophists taught subjects like logic, reason, and eloquence. These were meant to help students achieve arete, or excellence. But this specific concept of excellence was often challenged, especially by other philosophers. For example, Plato, Socrates, and Isocrates preferred a more moral approach and argued that rhetoric should be used as a means to serve the greater good. Socrates and Plato went even further, declaring that philosophy and wisdom were not only useful tools, but also ethical virtues.
Ancient Greek philosophy was multidisciplinary in nature. In addition to wisdom and logic, philosophers also studied and taught math, geometry, music theory, and even medicine. For example, the philosopher Prodicus wrote a treatise called On Human Nature, where he outlined various explanations on human physiology. Philosophy's influence was also great enough to affect medicine. Hippocratic physicians were known to incorporate philosophical ideas into their work, and the treatise On Airs seems to be influenced by pre-Socratic theories on air being the first principle of the universe. The famed philosopher Socrates had an ambiguous relationship with sophists. In Plato's dialogues, Socrates is portrayed as being in constant opposition with the famous sophists of his time. Aristophanes' comedy, The Clouds, meanwhile, depicts Socrates as a sophist himself, constantly demanding payment for his teachings. Socrates was in fact very poor and made no money off his teachings. He also differed from the sophists in that while they only taught aristocratic youths, Socrates taught everyone, regardless of station. Unfortunately, his controversial ideas and practices did not sit well with the city of Athens, and he was eventually tried for impiety. Philosophy was not only a collection of ideas, but a way of life. According to philosopher Pierre Hadot, his ancient counterparts had a daily regime of spiritual exercises to combat their passions, doubts, and illusory beliefs. These exercises included meditation on death, contemplation of nature, or speaking with a friend or mentor. Philosophers also followed specific dress codes and diets. They were also part of a community of masters and students. These communities were created and strengthened in schools. Plato founded such a school in the early 4th century BCE, when he purchased a property in a grove just outside of Athens. The school was designed to groom students into philosopher citizens, who could eventually rule the city in a measured and fair manner. It followed its own rules and was open to both male and female disciples. I can tell by the crease in your brow that you're already puzzling over the new things you've learned. Don't be embarrassed. Even the wisest among us need to ask questions before they search for answers. Is there anything else you'd like to do? You wish to test your wisdom? Very well. Let's see how you compare to the great philosophers. The first question is an easy one. What does philosophia mean? Correct! Philosophia referred to the love of wisdom. Time for the next question. The Kinosaries was a sanctuary dedicated to which Greek hero? The Kinosaries was not dedicated to Perseus. Try again. Correct. It was the mighty Heracles. Now, for the last question. Which play by Aristophanes portrayed Socrates as a sophist? 
yes, The Clouds was a comedy that portrayed the famous philosopher as a greedy sophist. Plato even believed that this caricature contributed to his mentor's eventual trial and execution. Well done, Wanderer. Even Socrates would be impressed by the depths of your wisdom. As you wish, Wanderer. Safe travels. Welcome to the Silver Mines of Lavrion. The mines make me nervous. All those fumes can't be safe to inhale day in and day out. The Lavrion Silver Mines were discovered between Thoricos and Cape Sunion, near Athens. They were rich in the mineral Galena and provided Athens with much of the silver necessary to mint its currency. Because of this, the mines were invaluable to the city, and the resources they provided helped turn Athens into one of the most powerful states in Greece. We will meet again after you've seen what the mines have to offer. Farewell for now, Wanderer. Pion C. Silver mines were extremely rare in ancient Greece, which only increased their importance. 
Athens started exploiting the Lavrian silver mines at the end of the 6th century BCE and used its metal to produce its currency. Production at the mines exploded around 485 BCE when an especially rich vein was discovered. The mine's abundant silver made Athens one of the wealthiest cities in Greece. They also provided the resources necessary to build a fleet large enough to defeat the Persians at the Battle of Salamis. In short, the Lavrian mines played an integral part in the emergence of Athens as a Greek superpower. Exploiting the mine's resources required a lot of labor. To meet this requirement and save on cost, Athens leased out mining concessions to its citizens, who had their slaves to do most of the work, alongside poor day laborers. In the 5th century BCE alone, there were anywhere from 10,000 to 30,000 people toiling in the mines of Lavrion. Together, the workers managed to produce an estimated 20 tons of silver per year. Mining in Lavrion was a two-step process. First, the ore was extracted, and then it was refined. It took about 16 kilograms of raw ore to produce a single pure silver drachma of about four grams. Recovered artifacts from the mines provide some insight into the specifics of the mining process. Galleries were dug to follow the veins of ore. They were small and did not offer much space for the workers. They were also hand cut, and it's believed that it took whole days to dig only a few centimeters. Once the galleries finally reached the veins, the ore was extracted and then crushed on mortar stone to prepare it for washing. Mine workers used washeries to help clean rock from the ore. 
The washing process required a large supply of water, but Lavrion was an infamously dry region. To compensate, cisterns were built in the mining area to collect and conserve seasonal rainwater. Once enough water had accumulated, workers poured it into wooden troughs containing rock and ore. The water's flow separated the lighter grains of rock from the heavier ore, which was caught in depressions at the bottom of the trough. The newly cleaned ore was collected for refinement, and the water was redirected back into a tank to be reused later. Once the ore was clean and dry, it was ready for smelting. Its purpose was to isolate the silver in the ore. To do this, the ore was placed in a conical furnace filled with combustible charcoal. Bellows pumped air into the furnace to control the temperature. Inside, the ore burned, emitting a toxic smoke that was evacuated through a chimney. Eventually, the silver alloy was separated from the slag and collected for the last step in the refinement process, cupellation. Cupellation removed any leftover lead from the silver. The smelted alloy was placed in a cupel, an absorbent bowl made of bone ashes. It was then put in a furnace, where it absorbed the lead and left only silver behind. While the mines of Lavrion belonged to Athens, the city frequently leased them to private citizens who exploited the site for anywhere from three to ten years. These citizens enlisted slaves and poor day laborers to carry out most of the work. The workers had a very low life expectancy, about three to five years, due to the hazardous working conditions. The dangers they faced included toxic lead vapor in the air and lung-choking dust in the galleries. However, they were fed well enough to keep up their work, and their combined labor managed to produce an estimated 20 tons of silver a year. you enjoyed your trip through the mines. We talk so much of Athens's glory, but we often forget the city's power was due to tremendous amounts of work. Work that often had a great human cost. What else would you like to do? Excellent, let's begin. What was the last step in the silver refinement process? Yes, copulation removed any remaining lead, leaving only the silver behind. Now, for the second question. How did workers acquire water 
for the ore washing process. Correct. The workers used cisterns to collect the seasonal rainwater. Now, the final question. Which famous battle did the mines help Athens win? Correct. The Athenians used silver from the mines to finance a massive fleet for the Battle of Salamis. It's clear your visit has taught you much. A job well done, Wanderer. Farewell, Wanderer. Best of luck on your journeys.
Greetings, Wanderer. It is my pleasure to introduce you to a unique tour. One that won't take you to impressive landmarks or famous battle sites, but through a typical Athenian home. If Olibos is Zeus's sanctuary, then my house is my own. It is a place where I can shelter myself from the noise and stress of city life. For an outgoing people like the Greeks, the house was a refuge of privacy. Inside, they could escape from the constant demands of civic life to enjoy the simple pleasures of family life. Look for me when you are done, and we can discuss the things you've seen. Farewell for now. The house, or oikos, was a residence for Greek families and their slaves. Contrary to modern houses, which look outward, the Greek household was built to look inward on a courtyard. The courtyard was the house's central fixture. It was the building's main source of daylight and also the location of religious altars dedicated to worship. The building itself was made up of familiar accommodations, including bedrooms, storage rooms, a kitchen, and a living room. Women were generally in charge of tending to the home, which in Greece was called oikonomia, a term that inspired the modern word economy. A pasta was a corridor that connected a house's courtyard to its residential section. Archaeological evidence from the city of Olynthos reveals that pastas were added to Greek home design in the 5th century BCE. Greeks had no qualms about combining their work and their private lives, and many of them worked from home. Artisans like blacksmiths, sculptors, and potters often had workshops in their houses. Some even operated small stores to sell their work. Similarly, doctors were known to treat patients in special offices located in their homes. Women also worked in the house and were responsible for making textiles, as well as producing clothes and supervising weaving which was carried out by slaves. If the household was wealthy enough, they could even produce a surplus of textiles to sell in times of financial difficulty.
The inner courtyard was the nexus of the house. Functionally, it allowed air to circulate and also provided access to most of the rooms. It also sometimes housed a well or a cistern that collected rainwater. In the center of the courtyard was an altar to Zeus Hercules, who served as the protector of the household. Women would often use the space to sew and cook, while children used it as a play area. Furthermore, if the family had pets or animals, the courtyard was where they were allowed to run free. The bathroom was located in the back of the house. Much like today, it was used for cleaning and washing, although the Greeks used chamber pots instead of toilets. Most bathrooms had a luterion that could be filled with water for washing. Mirrors, razors, strigils, and sponges could also be found in the bathroom, along with small vases called arebaloi, which were usually filled with perfume or oil. Greek homes had kitchens where the family's meals were prepared. They had mainly a grain-based diet, eating staples such as bread, porridge, or a barley cake. They had mainly a grain-based diet, eating staples such as bread, porridge, or a barley cake called maza. They also occasionally ate poultry, fish, and other seafood, as well as fruits, vegetables, goat milk and cheese, and olive oil. Food was cooked on a tripod, or sometimes in a klebanos, which was a sort of mobile oven. Other cooking implements included braziers, mortars and pestles, a spit to hold food over a fire, platters, and frying pans. The family also used the kitchen to store food in containers called pithoi. Symposia were major social institutions in Greece. They were drinking parties held exclusively for men. The party took place in the men's section of the house, the Andron, where residents and guests reclined on special couches called klinai. Food was served on low tables set in front of the couches, while wine was placed in a crater in the center of the room. During a symposium, Men drank, sang, had philosophical discussions, and played games like kotobos. Musicians, dancers, and even courtesans were often welcomed to attend as well. However, wives and daughters were always excluded. Pyrgos, or upper stories, was the women's quarter of the house, 
where they could pursue their activities and observe the city without being seen themselves. The rooftops were also used in a special rite called the Adonia, a private celebration held in honor of Adonis, which was reserved for women. At the beginning of spring, women filled terracotta pots with soil and lettuce seeds, then climbed a ladder to place the pots on the rooftop. These pots served as the women's very own Gardens of Adonis. I hope you now have a better understanding of the routines and home life of the Greek people. What would you like to do next? Then let's start with a simple question. Which group of people celebrated the Adonia? Correct. The Adonia was celebrated by women of all stations. Let's move on to the next question. Which of the following was known as the protector of the household? Yes, Zeus Herkios protected the household, and an altar to the god usually stood in the center of the house's courtyard. On to the final question. Which of the following was not located in the bathroom? I'm afraid mirrors were quite common in bathrooms. Keep trying. Correct. The Klivanos was a mobile oven usually found in the kitchen. It seems you really know your way around Greek homes. Well done, Wanderer. Farewell, Wanderer, and thank you for visiting my city. Welcome, Wanderer, to the democratic center of Athens, otherwise known as the Pnyx. The battles fought here may be more intellectual than bloody, but they are no less spectacular. These outcomes will affect an entire city in a different way. The Phoenix was the meeting place of the Athenian assembly and the physical embodiment of democracy at work. This tour will give you insight into how citizens made decisions and kept the city running. 
We can talk more when you have finished the tour. See you soon, Wanderer. The Athenian assembly was known as the Ecclesia. It met at the Pnyx 40 times a year to discuss various civic matters, and each session usually lasted a few hours. The word Pnyx is believed to mean something close to packed together. This was probably a reference to the fact that during meetings of the Ecclesia, the location would be filled to its capacity, with citizens packed in practically shoulder to shoulder. All male citizens were allowed to directly participate in the democratic process. Those over 20 years old had the right to speak and vote, while those over 30 could be elected to the higher position of magistrate. In total, there were approximately 30,000 citizens in Athens in the classical period. To draft and adopt decrees, 6,000 of them had to attend the meeting. The Athenian assembly and the, this the, all those in Citizens came from all over Attica's 10 districts to attend the meetings of the Ecclesia. The meeting was presided over by an executive council called the Pritones. Every session began with a sacrifice to Zeus Agoreos, the patron of the assembly. During the meeting, citizens delivered speeches from the Pnyx's platform on whatever issues the city faced. Afterwards, the issue was voted on with a show of hands from the gathered assembly. The Ecclesia made important decisions about subjects like grain importation, expenses, and declarations of war. While they could not directly enact laws, they had a say in appointing Athens' legislators which gave them a large role in shaping the city's daily operations. While some citizens only participated in the sessions of the Ecclesia, others could become more involved in democracy as magistrates. Magistrates were elected from among Athenian citizens over 30. They were often successful orators and charismatic politicians, and they held much more sway over important decisions than the average citizen. One of the most famous magistrates was Pericles, who was so popular, he held his position for 15 years.
In theory, every Athenian citizen over the age of 20 had the right to participate in the assembly. However, some of them lived far from the city, and others could not financially afford to miss a day of work to attend meetings. For these reasons, the city introduced a special allowance called a misthos ecclesiasticos in the 4th century BCE, meant to encourage participation. Originally, it was two obols, but the politician Cleon raised it to three. Athens introduced several innovations that heavily influence modern society, including theater, architecture, and philosophy. However, their greatest contribution was their democratic government, which introduced the concept of a city ruled by its citizens. The decision to adopt democracy as a government, a choice made in 508 BCE, shaped civilization as we know it and continues to affect us today. Hello again, Wanderer. I trust you appreciated learning about the inner workings of the city. Is there anything else you'd like to do? Then let's start with a simple question. Approximately how many citizens were in Athens in my time? Yes, there were approximately 30,000 citizens in Athens, although the population as a whole was much larger. On to the second question. Who of the following was a famous Athenian magistrate? Yes, Pericles was an extremely popular magistrate who managed to keep his position for 15 years. Only one question left. What does the word Penix mean? Correct. The Penix was usually crowded with citizens attending meetings of the Ecclesia. You know enough about democracy to be a politician yourself. Well done, Wanderer. Very well. Farewell, Wanderer. Papse, krasosi!
Greetings, Wanderer, and welcome to the port of Piraeus. Piraeus is one of the busiest, most important ports in the Greek world. Money flows through here like a river, a river that runs all the way to Athens. Acting as a port for Athens, Piraeus welcomed merchants, goods, and travelers from all over the world. It was a central part of Athens' economy, but it was also fortified enough to protect the city's considerable fleet. When you finish exploring the port, find me, and we will talk further. Piraeus, a peninsula southwest of Athens, became the city's main port after the politician Themistocles encouraged the development of its natural harbors. These developments led to the gradual abandonment of the older harbor of Phaleron. Piraeus's fortifications were further developed by Chemon and Pericles, along with the long walls, which ensured goods could still be moved during sieges. Piraeus was divided into three main sectors, the military port, the emporion, and the residential area. By the 5th century BCE, it had become not only Athens' naval headquarters, but also the mercantile center of the Mediterranean. Piraeus's development during the 5th century BCE attracted a large population. Many craftsmen, merchants, bankers, sailors, and ship owners moved to the port in great numbers. The population was a mix of Greek citizens, foreign visitors, and immigrants known as metics. The variety of the port's inhabitants gave Piraeus a cosmopolitan atmosphere. Most of the residents were involved in trade but others worked on shipbuilding or in larger scale industries like shield factories. Piraeus's commercial focus offered many opportunities for those seeking to increase their wealth and status. One such rags to riches tale is that of Passion, a slave who eventually became a citizen and earned a fortune thanks to his bank and his shield factory. Piraeus was a demi, or district, of Attica. Because of its size, function, and varied population, it had a much more complicated administrative structure than other deems. Above all, Piraeus was closely monitored and controlled by the Athenian assembly due to its importance to the city. Within the port, there were two separate categories of trade. International trade, which took place in the Emporion, and retail trade, which was managed by Kapaloi in Piraeus's Agora.
The Emporion was a commercial port dedicated to trading goods from overseas. All international transactions were required to be made within its limits and needed to be exclusively wholesale. Elected magistrates managed all business and laws in the port. Meanwhile, port authorities known as Epimelites oversaw trade and took care of the regulation of prices. This was an especially crucial duty, as the amount of supplies and goods could fluctuate wildly based on factors like bad harvests or lost cargo. Common products sold in the Emporion included vegetables, fruits, fish, leather, timber, marble, metal, weapons, and ceramics. According to Hermippos, Athens was also wealthy enough to afford the finest goods from all over the world, including figs from Rhodes, almonds from Thassos, oil from Samos, and wine from Chios. Taxes were collected on all merchandise that came into the Emporion, which provided Athens with a major source of income. After arriving in the Emporion, merchants set up samples of their goods in a display area called the Daigma. This was where citizens and foreigners gathered to officially make their deals. And almost all merchandise that came into the Emporion was traded within the area. The Daigma was under constant supervision by magistrates who negotiated price control with the importers. They would occasionally give special privileges to those who agreed to sell at lower prices. These privileges ranged from tax exemptions to specially reserved seating in the theater. Piraeus was a deem, and as such, was supervised by a magistrate called the Demarchos. While most Demarchoi were chosen locally within their deem, Piraeus was appointed directly by Athens, so the city could better monitor its commercial interests. In fact, matters regarding the Emporion, the military harbor, and the grain trade were regularly debated and decided by the Athenian assembly. Transactions within the Piraeus were supervised by metronomoi. These were magistrates responsible for keeping track of weights and measures. They made sure merchants' measurements were always accurate to prevent bad deals and scams. Even though Piraeus would eventually develop into a city in its own right, it always remained under the control of Athens. commercial tax of 2%, or a pentecost, was placed on all cargo entering and leaving Piraeus. The tax was collected by a group of five people called Pentecostologoi. According to Andocides, this position could be bought for the hefty sum of 30 talents, or 180,000 drachmae. However, most of these officials made a profit of up to six talents, making the job very lucrative. While merchants were responsible for setting the value of their goods, Pentecostologoi had the power to challenge the value if they saw fit. Furthermore, merchants were required to register with these officials before they could transport, display, and sell their goods. Overall, 
This system provided Piraeus, and by extension Athens, with a tremendous amount of money. The sale of grain was overseen by special magistrates called Sitophilakes. Since some Greek cities had a grain deficiency and relied heavily on imports, these officials were extremely important. Their duties encompassed all aspects of grain commerce, including price control and profit margins, to ensure Athens remained well fed. This is no surprise. Grain was so important to Athens that two-thirds of all stocks were required to be transported and sold at the city's agora by law. According to Demosthenes, the significance of the Sitophilakes was such that if they failed in their duties, they faced the death penalty. The Emporion operated on a foundation of credit and loans. Overseas commerce was handled by two types of tradespeople. Emporoi transported cargo in borrowed ships, while Naukloroi were ship owners who moved goods on their own vessels. Elsewhere in the Emporion were bankers and accountants who arranged loans and kept track of incoming and outgoing ships. Emporoi and Naukloroi financed their maritime voyages with these loans, which often had a high interest rate due to the dangers of sea travel. Emporoi used the loans to pay for both the cargo and the right to a ship, while Naukloroi only had to pay for their crew. Loans and interest were repaid upon a ship's return to port. However, in the event of a catastrophe such as a shipwreck, the merchant and ship owner were released from their obligations, and the losses were transferred to the lender. You've returned. I hope you enjoyed your stroll through the port. Piraeus was important to Athens' commercial interests, but it eventually came into its own as a vibrant and bustling port. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask. If you say so, let us see what you've learned, wanderer. First, a simple question. Which Athenian politician originally encouraged the development of Piraeus' natural harbors? Pericles did contribute to the port's development, but he was building off someone else's ideas. Try again. Correct. Themistocles saw Piraeus' potential as a port and encouraged its development. On to the next question. What did the Sitophilake supervise? Yes, Sitophilakes had the extremely important responsibility of handling all matters related to grain commerce. Only one question left. What was the name of the slave who took advantage of Piraeus' opportunities to earn themselves citizenship? Correct! Passion managed to earn a fortune and achieve citizenship thanks to both his bank and a successful shield business. Your knowledge of Piraeus is impressive. Well done, Wanderer. As you wish, thank you for visiting.
Se va a todo.
Greetings, wanderer, and welcome to the Agora of Athens. I love this Agora. Where else could you find a common fish merchant and an extravagant jewelry seller within a few feet of each other? It's that kind of variety that makes city life so rich and exciting. The Agora is the beating heart of any Greek city. It is a place where all types of people may gather, from citizens and foreigners to magistrates and philosophers. All manner of business is conducted here, including political meetings, legal proceedings, and trade. When you finish exploring, come find me, and we can talk more. See you soon, Wanderer. The Agora was the civic center of Athens, but it wasn't only frequented by politicians and city officials. The area housed a market where people could purchase food and other goods from merchants. It was also frequented by philosophers who used the public space to establish schools and pass on their teachings to students. Religion had its place as well. Temples dedicated to Hephaestus and Apollo were located in the Agora, along with the altar of the Twelve Gods and the monument of the eponymous heroes. The painted stoa, or stoa poikile, derived its name from the panel paintings on its wall. The paintings were created in the 5th century BCE by famous artists like Polygnotos and depicted Greek military victories like the Battle of Marathon. The stoa served as a public meeting place for citizens, but it was especially popular with philosophers who used the space to pass on their teachings. In 301 BCE, the philosopher Zeno of Kition chose the Stoa Poikile as the location for his school of philosophy, the appropriately dubbed Stoicism. Trade in the Agora was supervised by magistrates. There were five Agoranomoi who kept order in the market, controlled the quality of goods, and collected market dues. This provided revenue to the city and helped pay the magistrates and those in charge of maintaining order. The market benefited everyone. Customers bought what they needed, merchants made their living, and city officials received the money they needed to keep the wheels of democracy turning. The original Temple of Apollo Patroas 
was built around 535 BCE by Pisistratos, but was destroyed by the Persians during their invasion a few decades later. It long remained in ruins, except for the altar, which was left standing as a reminder of the Persian sacrilege. Eventually, a new temple was built in the 4th century BCE. Inside was a statue made by Euphranor, the same artist who painted in the Stoa of Zeus. The temple held special significance in Athens as it was connected to the origin of the city's people. The name Patroos, meaning fatherly, referenced the belief that Apollo was the father of Eon, founder of the Ionian Greeks from whom all Athenians are descended. The temple of Hephaestus overlooks the Agora from the Colonus Agoraeus Hill. Today, it is one of the best preserved temples in Greece, owing to its conversion to a church in the Middle Ages. But while this transformation preserved the structure, it also damaged the surrounding sculptures. The temple was dedicated not only to Hephaestus, the god of metallurgy, but also to Athena Ergane, goddess of arts and crafts. Nearly every part of the Hephaestion was lavishly decorated with depictions of famous mythological events, like the labors of Theseus. The Theseus scenes gave the temple the nickname Theseion, a name that lives on today as a city district in Athens. The Bulaterion was another building in the Agora that contributed to the democratic process. It housed the Athenian Council of Citizens, the Boule. This Council of 500 was composed of 50 members from each Greek tribe, all of whom served a one-year term. They were chosen by lot from among citizens over 30. Every month, one group of 50 was chosen to lead the Boule's executive committee, the Pritinaeus. The Pritaneus met every day of the month and called meetings of the full council in the Bulaterion, where they spent their time discussing bills.
Prita Neon was one of the most important buildings in the Agora, as it was the headquarters of the Pritaneus. The Pritaneus was the executive committee of the Boule, who ran the city's daily operations. The Pritaneus dined in the Pritaneon, and 17 of them slept on site to ensure there were always officials available to deal with emergencies. The Pritaneon also housed the official weights and measures of the city. The fire of Hestia, which provided sacred fire for all public sacrifices, was also located there. The Heliaia was the most important court in Athens and was presided over by a group of judges called Heliasts. Judging was a regular part of an Athenian citizen's life, with trials happening almost every day. Heliasts were chosen randomly based on two factors. First, that they were on the official list of 6,000 potential Heliasts. Second, that they were present at court on the day of the trial. A stipend of two obols was established by Pericles to compensate for the loss of work while on Helias duty, and also to encourage participation in the judiciary process. In the Agora, an Athenian could buy and sell many different products. The permanent retail market was divided into sections according to the category of merchandise. Merchants and craftsmen who worked in the market could be citizens, foreigners, or even freed slaves. They sold everything from food and clothes to jewelry and slaves. With so much variety, competition was fierce and that competition helped regulate the market's prices. The Heliaia wasn't the only court in Athens. This other court was located next to the South Stoa. Historians believe it to be a court based on the discovery of a nearby box containing seven bronze ballots. These ballots were used by jurors to give their verdicts. The reason trials were so common in Athens might have been related to their democratic regime, which promoted the individual's right to demand reparations for injustice. However, not all legal matters were settled in this fashion. If a claim was small enough, it was settled individually by a magistrate. Public trials were reserved for more serious offenses, such as murder, theft, and political crimes.
the mint was where the city made its coinage. It is believed that Athens mint was in the city's agora, as modern excavations have turned up small disc-shaped pieces of metal used to make coins. Much of the silver required for minting coinage came from the Lavrion silver mines. Athens was so dependent on the mines that when they lost them during the Peloponnesian War, the city was forced to melt down a gold statue of Athena to mint gold coins and avert a monetary crisis. You have now experienced the Agora, following in the footsteps of countless Athenians before you. I hope the trip has impressed upon you how important this place was to trade, politics, and law. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask. Very well, let's begin. Which philosopher's school took its name from the painted stoa? Yes, Zenon taught at the Stoa, and so he and his followers were dubbed Stoics. Time for another question. What other name has the Iphistion gone by? The Temple of Iphistos depicted scenes from the labors of Heracles, but it was never known as the Heraklion. Try again. Correct. The name was inspired by the scenes showing the hero Theseus, which decorate the temple. Only one question left. When Athens lost the Lavrion silver mines during the Peloponnesian War, which statue did they melt down to mint new coins? Correct. The Athenians melted down a statue of Athena to mint gold coins. It's clear you are very familiar with the Agora of Athens. I'm impressed. Farewell, Wanderer. May we see each other again soon.
Hello, Wanderer. May I introduce you to the Keramikos, the kiln that warms all of Athens' pottery. The art produced here is some of the most beautiful in the Greek world. <laughs> I envy the potter's skills, though I'm not quite as envious of their clay-stained hands. It's bad for the nails. The Keramikos was a special neighborhood in Athens, where potters created vases and containers that stood all over Greece. This tour will take you through the elaborate process needed to turn something as simple as muddy clay into ornate perfume vases and gilded wine cups. Come find me when you complete your visit, and we can talk more about what you've learned. The Keramikus was a large, sprawling area northwest of Athens' Acropolis. While part of it was used as a graveyard, it was also dedicated to the creation of pottery. The Keramikus was so significant to the art form that its name lives on in the word ceramics. Perhaps drawn by the river, potters moved into the area and formed their own bustling community. It's believed that by the end of the 5th century BCE, Hundreds of thousands of pottery vessels had been made in Athens. Including everything from heavy, undecorated cooking pots to delicate and beautiful containers reserved for the most precious oils. Sadly, only around 1% of these works survive today. Some only in small fragments. Raw clay from a river was hardly fit for a potter's wheel. Athenian potters used clay that was rich in iron, which created the distinctive orange-red coloring seen in Athenian pottery. But this high-quality clay needed to be handled carefully to avoid disasters in the kiln later on. The clay was first brought to settling beds, where it was mixed with water to wash out any organic debris like leaves. Once it was purified, workers kneaded the clay with their hands to push out air bubbles and create the texture necessary for a flawless finish. One of the goals of these early steps was to remove any impurities that could destroy a delicate design, or worse, render a vase unusable. Once the clay was cleaned, it was up to the potter to shape it into a vase by spinning it on a wheel or pressing it into a mold. Their choice depended on what shape they wanted for the vase, but they also considered the possible scope of its decoration. Potters did not work alone. A workshop might have had many people working together on different aspects of production. Potters collaborated with many different painters for decorating their creations. Some of these painters even became potters themselves. All in all, a single vase could be worked on by many different artists, with each one focusing on a different aspect of its design. After the pots were shaped and decorated, they were packed into kilns for the lengthy and delicate firing process. The process had three stages, oxidation, reduction, and reoxidation. The main purpose of the firing process was to carefully manage the clay's exposure to oxygen. 
The chemical reactions caused by firing gave the pots their distinctive orange-red coloring. This also turned the designs made from the clay decoration slips glossy and black. The most difficult part of the firing process was managing the fires themselves. It required an enormous amount of skill and experience to properly judge the exact temperatures needed, and even the smallest mistake could ruin several hours of work. Vases could be decorated in all sorts of ways. Before 530 BCE, Athenian vases were decorated using the black figure technique, where figures and designs were painted as dark silhouettes. At the end of the 6th century BCE, painters created a new technique called red figure, an inversion of the painting process that left the figures in red and the background in black. This gave the artists more freedom to better explore details like muscles and individual locks of hair. Designs were sketched onto the bare surface of the pot using a thin, sharp tool. Thin relief lines, which helped define subtle elements like facial features, were added using a brush made of a few stiff hairs. More elaborate vases were sometimes gilded, but these decorations were so delicate, they were most likely only added after the firing process. returned. As you can see, pottery was an arduous and delicate process, but was exemplary of the skill and craftsmanship that dominated Greek art and culture. Now, is there something else you'd like to do? Then let's get right to it, starting with an easy question. What was responsible for the orange-red color of most Athenian vases? Correct! Athenian potters worked with clay that was rich with iron, and that iron created a distinctive orange-red coloring. On to the next question. What were the chambers for firing pottery called? Correct. Pottery was fired in kilns, and the firing process was extremely precise and delicate in nature. You're almost done. Just one more question. The firing process was made up of how many stages? Correct. The three stages of the firing process were oxidation, reduction, and re-oxidation. You know your pottery. Well done, Wanderer. Then we must part ways, at least for now. Farewell, Wanderer.
somewhere. Welcome, traveler, to the site of the legendary Battle of Marathon. My name is Herodotus, and I am a traveler from Harikanassus. I retrace the cause of various events, such as wars and great calamities. I describe what I see and record what I'm told, all with the aim of providing a better understanding of why these things occur. Look for me to introduce you to many sites. It's truly incredible that such a small place would have such tremendous significance. But then again, even the tiniest pebble can send ripples through the water. Marathon was the location of one of the greatest battles in Greek history. It was here where Athenians made a stand against the might of an imposing Persian fleet. Your visit will take you through the causes of the conflict, the battle itself, and its far-reaching consequences. I will see you again once you're through. Farewell for now. In 490 BCE, 600 Persian triremes landed on a beach 35 kilometers north of Athens. Standing in their way were 11,000 hoplites led by the prestigious Athenian general Miltiades. The Persian forces outnumbered the Greeks approximately five to one, and yet the smaller force managed to push back their would-be conquerors. The Battle of Marathon was a major turning point in the Greco-Persian Wars, and the Athenians' victory would be celebrated for many years. The modern-day distance running event is named a marathon in memory of a soldier from the battle who ran back to Athens to announce their victory. Though whether this is real or legend is uncertain.
The Persians wanted to invade Greece in part due to its rich silver mines. In 545 BCE, they came closer to this goal after their victory over Croesus, the king of Lydia. The victory forced some Greek populations in Asia Minor to surrender and gave the Persians a solid foothold to carry out a large-scale invasion. In 494 BCE, the city of Miletus revolted against its Persian rulers. They were aided by Athens and the nearby city of Eritrea, and even burned down an important Persian temple. The Persian king Darius was enraged by their sacrilege, and in 491 BCE, sent messengers to the Greek cities demanding their submission. Athens and Sparta killed the Persian messengers, goading Darius to invade. The Persians began their attacks, first capturing the city of Naxos and enslaving its inhabitants, then taking the city of Eritrea. Filled with confidence from their string of victories, the Persians set their sights on Athens. The Greeks were surprised by the ferocity of the Persian attacks. Seeking aid against the upcoming invasion, Athens was forced to appeal to other cities for help. In a surprising move, they asked for aid from Sparta, known for having the strongest army in Greece. The Spartans agreed to the request, but they were unable to send reinforcements in time due to the religious feast of Apollo Carneos, which forbade them from leaving their city until the next full moon. The only extra help Athens managed to acquire was from the small Boeotian city of Plataea, which sent an additional 1,000 hoplites. This was the first time in Greek history that their entire civilization was under attack from an external invader. Despite sharing the same language and same religion, Greek city-states had often warred amongst themselves. The Persian invasion was the first time they realized the necessity of collective action to ensure their survival. The Persian fleet originally planned to land at the port of Phaleron, However, the exiled Athenian tyrant Hippias, who sided with the Persians, advised them to land at Marathon instead, where it would be easier to deploy cavalry. The Athenians were unaware of the Persian battle plans and left Marathon undefended. This allowed the Persians to quietly set up camp on the beach while Athens scrambled to mount a defense. The Persians' overwhelming numerical superiority forced the Athenians to get creative with their defensive strategy. The city sent 10,000 hoplites, along with the extra 1,000 Plataean reinforcements, to a hill located above the Persian encampment. Once in position, Athenians had to decide whether to wait for the Persians to attack or to strike them first. Athens' strategists believed the former option was better but the general Miltiades believed a first strike was more advantageous. 
as the Persians had their backs to the sea. In the end, Miltiades' opinion prevailed, and the Greeks made their move. According to Herodotus, the Greek forces charged at the Persians without archers or cavalry. The Persians were unprepared for what they saw as an act of madness. While they were able to hold the Greeks back at first, they were eventually pushed back to their ships and forced to retreat. The Persians suffered heavy losses during the battle, with approximately 6,400 casualties. The Athenians, on the other hand, only lost 192 soldiers. The victory at Marathon was considered miraculous. The Greeks attributed this miracle to the appearance of legendary heroes who they allegedly saw return from the dead to fight at their side in defense of the city. For example, several Athenians swore they saw the mythical King Theseus take up arms at Marathon, a scene which would later be depicted in Athens' Agora. Similarly, some hoplites attested that Heracles appeared at Marathon, clad in his lion skin and wielding a club. The supposed appearance of these heroes helped elevate the Battle of Marathon to a legendary status among the Greek people. After the Persians fled Marathon, they tried to invade Athens by way of the Bay of Phaleron. However, this gave the Athenians time to return to their city and mount a proper defense. Fearing further losses, the admiral of the Persian fleet called off their attack, and the Persians returned to their empire. Darius was furious at the campaign's failure and decided to seek vengeance in a retaliatory expedition from both land and sea. Meanwhile, Sparta begrudgingly congratulated Athens on their victory. The victory at Marathon marked the beginning of a new era for Athens. According to Herodotus, Athens' success at pushing back the Persians ranked them first in the ongoing competition between the Greek city-states. The Athenians immortalized their prestige by erecting monuments in both their own city and in Delphi. The Battle of Marathon was also perceived as a blow against tyranny. Tyranny went from being perceived as a simple flaw in authoritarian excess to major treason against the homeland, a sin that rulers would take great pains to avoid being accused of. This helped consolidate the institution of democracy for the next two centuries.
I hope you enjoyed this look into the famous Battle of Marathon. It was not only a major turning point in the history of Athens, but also for all of Greece. Its repercussions would be felt for many years to come. Is there anything else you'd like to do? Of course. Let's start with a simple question. Which Athenian general led the Greek forces at Marathon? Leonidas was a Spartan warrior king and would not have led an army of Athenian soldiers. Try again. Alcibiades was Athenian, yes, but he was born a few decades too late to fight in the battle. Keep trying. Brasidas was a Spartan general, and while Athens asked Sparta for aid, they were unable to send reinforcements in time for the battle. But please, try another answer. Correct. Miltiades led the forces at Marathon, and it was his strategy that helped the Greeks push the Persians back. Time for another question. Which Greek city revolted against the Persians in 494 BCE? Persepolis was actually the ceremonial capital of the Persian Empire, so I doubt it had much reason to revolt. Keep trying, though. No, I'm afraid Naxos was taken by the Persian fleet on their way to Athens. Try another answer. Correct. Miletos revolted against Persian rule, with support from both Athens and Eretria. One more question. Which other Greek city aided Athens at Marathon? Unfortunately, Eretria was taken by the Persians, and thus unable to help. Keep trying. I'm afraid Naxos was pillaged by the Persians on their way to attack Athens. Try again. Yes. Plataea sent 1,000 Obides to aid the Athenian forces. Well done, traveler. You have learned much. Farewell, traveler. I hope to see you again soon.
Here, visitor, and welcome to the sacred site. Delphi is an amazing place to visit if you're looking for information. I've come here on several occasions in search of answers to some particularly puzzling questions. And sometimes I even found them. This is Delphi, home of the renowned oracle. Greeks considered it the navel of the world. Pilgrims and kings journeyed here from all over Greece and beyond, seeking advice from Apollo through the voice of his interpreter, Pythia. During your visit, you will experience the sanctuary through a pilgrim's eye and discover how important oracles and prophecies were to the people of Greece. Now, go off and begin your pilgrimage. I will be waiting for you at the end of your visit. On their journey to the Temple of Apollo, pilgrims walked this sacred path up Mount Parnassus. The summer sun beat down hot on their backs. Along the way, they took in the magnificent monuments, treasuries and statues that adorned the road. These landmarks were tokens of people's reverence for the Oracle's benevolence. All were dedicated to Apollo, and most were offered by cities to commemorate military victories. The monuments represented not only their donors' piety, but also their power and wealth. The sanctity of Delphi has endured to the present day, and visitors still take this very same route.
One of the most impressive dedications to Apollo came from the Canidians, a Greek population that colonized the island of Lipari, north of Sicily. The story behind this dedication is notable. The Canidians were at war with the Etruscans in the Tyrrhenian Sea. Seeking a good omen, the Canidians consulted the Oracle, and following her advice, they successfully captured 20 enemy ships. To thank Apollo, they offered the god the same number of statues as ships seized. Next to the Naxian Sphinx stood a simple structure to display offerings from the Athenians, most of which were spoils of war. In particular, these offerings, called ex votos, were prows of sunken Persian ships. The Athenians built the portico after their naval victory over the Persians in 478 BCE. Once arriving before the temple, pilgrims wishing to consult the oracle had to first pay a tax. This tax gave them the initial right to approach the altar of Apollo and make an animal sacrifice to the god. But before proceeding to the Pythia, the preliminary ritual had to succeed. If the animal reacted favorably and showed signs of acceptance to the god, it was sacrificed, and the pilgrim would be allowed to enter the temple to question the Pythia. At last, we arrive at the Temple of Apollo, where the Oracle relayed her prophecies. The temple was the final destination of those seeking an audience with the Pythia, and its appearance matched the majesty of its purpose. Atop its imposing columns, the structure's pediments displayed famous mythological scenes sculpted by the renowned Greek artist Antenor. But as grand as the temple looked from the outside, it paled in comparison 
with what happened within. Prophecies were given in the most restricted part of the temple, the Adytum, by a chaste woman known as the Pythia. Before delivering prophecies, she first purified herself with water, then burned laurel leaves and barley flour to begin the ritual. Finally, while seated on a tripod surrounded by offerings, the Pythia delivered Apollo's messages. Her words were often strange and indecipherable and required further interpretation by the temple's priests. Despite much research, the exact causes of the oracle's behavior while prophesying are debated to this day. Myths say that while searching for an oracle who could impart their words to mortals, Apollo established a sanctuary on Mount Parnassos. Apollo took over this site by slaying its sinister guardian, the snake-like Pytho. Your visit is complete. I hope you now understand how important this sanctuary was and how it affected the lives of people both in the Greek world and beyond its borders. To be honest, I could speak about Delphi all day. But what would you like to do now? Ah, you wish to test your knowledge. Let's begin with a simple question. What did the oracle use to purify herself before her predictions? Correct. The oracle used water for purification. Time for another question. Which god was believed to speak through the oracle at Delphi? Yes, the oracle allegedly spoke the words of Apollo, which were then interpreted by priests. One final question for you. Delphi is situated on which mountain? Correct. Delphi stood on the slope of Mount Parnassos. Well done, traveler. Your knowledge rivals that of the wisest philosophers. As you wish. It has been a pleasure sharing Delphi with you.
Welcome, visitor, to Thermopylae. My name is Leonidas. I am a king of Sparta. But do not think me some idle aristocrat softened by luxury. When Spartans go to war, I stand alongside them shield to shield. And my spear tastes the same blood as those of my men. Thermopylae stirs many feelings in my heart. Rage at the Persians' arrogance. Regret that I could not do more. But mostly, I feel proud. Proud of my city, and of my men, who fought to protect the very soul of the Spartan people. For those few fateful days, they were my brothers. I miss them all. Thermopylae was where a courageous group of Spartans stood amongst other Greek soldiers and held off the forces of King Xerxes, the Persian. When you're done, find me and we'll speak more. The Persian king Darius's cries of rage echoed for years after his humiliating defeat at Marathon. Even after Darius's death, his son Xerxes continued to seek vengeance against the Greeks. According to Aeschylus, Asia was emptied of all its men. Greek spies brought the news of Xerxes's imminent invasion back to their homeland. Afterwards, many discussions were had on the best place to mount a defense. In the end, the Greeks decided on Thermopylae. The area featured a narrow pass that could act as a bottleneck for the Persian army, negating their numerical superiority. It also offered naval advantages, offering the Greek fleets opportunities for flanking. 5,000 Peloponnesian Greeks set up at a fort near the entrance of the narrow passage, otherwise known as the Hot Gates. Leading them was Leonidas, a Spartan king who prided himself on supposedly being a direct descendant of Heracles. Leonidas was accompanied by several elite soldiers who together made up the famous 300 Spartans. The Persian army arrived in the summer of 480 BCE, preceded by a flood of rumors regarding their strength and numbers. It was claimed they consumed 6,000 tons of wheat every day, and that they dried every river and brook they passed to quench their near insatiable thirst. During their march to Thermopylae, the Persians faced no opposition, and in fact, increased their numbers further by recruiting more soldiers from other Greek cities and places like Thrace. According to Herodotus, the last count of the Persian fleet was numbered at 1,207 boats mounted by approximately 240,000 men. He estimates the land army, meanwhile, was made up of more than one million men. The Greek forces at Thermopylae were heavily outnumbered. Xerxes believed that at the sight of his massive army, 
the Greeks at Thermopylae would flee in terror. Instead, they deliberated. The majority of the Peloponnesians wanted to engage the Persians on the Isthmus of Corinth. Leonidas, meanwhile, believed it was wiser to stay put in Thermopylae. While the Greek forces debated, a Persian horseman was sent to spy on the enemy. He returned to Xerxes with surprising news. Not only were the Greeks not fleeing, but the Spartans guarding the fort were exercising and combing their hair. A far cry from the fearful soldiers Xerxes expected. To increase the pressure on the Greeks, Xerxes waited four more days, then attacked on the fifth. The Persians faced heavy resistance and suffered many losses. And Herodotus says Xerxes leaped three times from his chair, seized with fear for his army. The following day proved to be just as difficult for the Persian forces, and the Greeks continued to stand their ground. The Persians seemed poised to be held at Thermopylae indefinitely until an inhabitant from the region came forward with information. He told the Persians of another route which could take them around Thermopylae. A Persian contingent was sent to verify the information. While there were Greek soldiers stationed to guard the route, they were forced to flee from the Persians. Thus, on the third day of the battle, the Greeks were surrounded by their enemy. With the Persians both in front of and behind them, the Greek forces at Thermopylae realized they had two choices, flee to live another day, or stand and fight till their last breath. Most of the Greeks chose the former option, but some stayed, including Leonidas and his 300 Spartans. For the Spartans, dying a glorious death was one of the highest honors they could achieve. The few members of Leonidas' Spartans who did not participate in the last stand at Thermopylae, felt that they had missed an opportunity for honor and either committed suicide or continued living under the mockery and disgust of their fellow citizens. The Spartans' last stand was not only for glory, though. Had they not hold off the Persians, the Greeks' retreating forces would probably have been cut down by enemy horsemen. On the morning of the third day, King Xerxes was assured of his victory. However, that victory did not come easy. King Leonidas himself fell in battle, and a furious fight broke out around his body. The Spartans fought to the last man, and when they had all been slain, Leonidas's body was brought before Xerxes. According to Herodotus, Persians usually honored the most courageous warriors even if they were enemies. However, Xerxes was so consumed by rage at the Spartans' resistance that instead he cut off Leonidas's head 
and ordered it impaled on a stake. A statue of a lion was later erected on the hill of the Spartans' last stand in honor of Leonidas' bravery. Though they were victorious, the Battle of Thermopylae shook the morale of the Persian army. They had lost thousands of men, while Greek casualties only numbered in the hundreds. And due to the sacrifice of the Spartans, the rest of the Greek army had been able to successfully retreat and regroup. As a result, even as Xerxes set up camp at the foot of Athens' Acropolis, Ready to get revenge for his father's humiliating defeat at Marathon, the Persians were more anxious than confident. They were more aware than ever that the Greeks did not fear them and were ready to die defending their land. In the end, the Battle of Thermopylae was still a loss for the Greeks. However, the battle gave the Greeks a boost in morale that carried them all the way to their decisive victory over the Persians in the Battle of Plataea in 479 BCE. With the war against the Persians finally won, the Greeks were able to honor the sacrifice of Leonidas and his Spartans with memorials and poems, forever solidifying the glory of Sparta's military prowess. The newfound respect for Sparta was noteworthy because before the war, the city was seen as no more than a bully who forced itself into the affairs of others. Thermopylae changed the opinions of Sparta for the better and gave them a legitimate claim to be one of Greece's most powerful and influential cities. You finished. I hope you understand the magnitude of the sacrifices made at Thermopylae. Without them, the Greek people would have surely ended as a footnote in Persian history. Is there something else you'd like to do? If you think you're ready, let's begin. First question, who was Xerxes' father? Yes, one of the main reasons Xerxes invaded Greece was to get revenge for Darius's defeat at the Battle of Marathon. Another question for you. Which battle is seen as the final victory against Xerxes' Persian forces? The Battle of Salamis ended with an impressive Greek victory, but it did not send the Persians home. Keep trying. Correct. The Battle of Plataea helped put an end to Xerxes' invasion. One last question. How many Spartans fought at the Battle of Thermopylae? No. If that were true, we would not have lost. Try a different answer. Yes. 300 of us stood against Xerxes' forces. You've done well, visitor. I have no more questions for you.
Farewell, visitor.
Αληθώς του το συνέβη. Συνέβη μόλις.
Αδύνατο να στείλει. Hello, my friend. It is my pleasure to introduce you to Corinth's Temple of Aphrodite. Why, I'm Marcos, of course, one of the most successful merchants in all of Greece. You really haven't heard of me? My name is known from Kefalonia to Kos. If you've ever paid money for something, I probably received a percentage. But enough about me. Let's go back to what you're doing here. It really is a lovely sight, isn't it? The temple, that is, uh, not the ladies. Although they are also lovely. Lovely and lively and, uh, I'm sorry, uh, what were we talking about? In Greece, many love stories were told about the gods. How romantic. Sometimes they were heartwarming and happy, but they often ended in tears, tragedy, and a whole brood of illegitimate children. <laughs> I'm looking at you, Zeus! Anyway, this tour will introduce you to some of these divine love stories, which may give you perspective on how the Greeks approached love in their own lives. Enjoy your visit, my friend. I'll come see you again when you finish the tour. Much like Athens, Corinth had its own Acropolis, called the Acrocorinth. The natural promontory provided an excellent view of the surrounding territory. It was also the home of several sanctuaries, allegedly constructed in the 6th century BCE. The Acrocorinth's most famous attraction was the Temple of Aphrodite. Pisanius describes it as having statues of Aphrodite, her son Eros, and the sun god Helios. According to Strabo, the temple's most distinguishing feature was its servants, who acted as sacred prostitutes. However, Strabo is the only source for this information, and it is still hotly debated to this day. Love played a large role in countless mythological stories. Zeus himself was not immune to the feeling and fell for both mortals and other deities. Some myths centered on forbidden feelings that led to tragedy, such as Phaedra's love for her stepson, Hippolytus. While marriage was prominent in mythology, it was usually presented as problematic. For example, Aphrodite frequently cheated on her husband, Hephaestus, and Medea's resentment against her ex-husband Jason eventually drove her mad enough to murder her children. These less-than-ideal depictions reflected the Greeks' idea of marriage, which they viewed as a civic duty instead of a romantic union. The goddess Aphrodite was one of the mightiest Olympians and was typically associated with love, beauty, and sex. She was worshipped all across the ancient Mediterranean by men and women, both young and old. Her origins differ depending on the version of the story. The poet Hesiod says that she was born from the severed genitals of Oranos while Homer's version of the myth names her as the daughter of Zeus and Dione. Aphrodite appeared regularly in mythological stories and had many mortal lovers. Her favorite was Adonis, a beautiful boy who died tragically in a hunting accident. Aphrodite was devastated by his death, so she created a cult called the Adonia to commemorate him. Ugh! 
My friend, good to see you again. I bet you were surprised by some of the stories you heard. For a bunch of immortal beings, the gods certainly were saucy, eh? Tell me if there's anything else I can do for you. Is that so, my friend? Then let's get started. Which poet said that Aphrodite was the daughter of Zeus and Vioni? Yes, it was Homer who said Aphrodite was a child of Zeus. On to the next question. Medea was married to which legendary hero? Yes, Medea was married to Iason, but after he left her for someone else, she resented him so much, she murdered their children. But let's not talk about such depressing things. Instead, you can answer this last question. What was the name of Corinth's Acropolis? No. Although now that I hear it, I must admit that Acropolint really rolls off the tongue. Correct. The Acro Corinth has been home to many sanctuaries, as well as the famous Temple of Aphrodite. You passed the test! Congratulations, my intelligent friend! Normally, I don't let people go until they buy a souvenir, but for you, my friend, I'll make an exception! Welcome to Corinth, Wanderer. I have a special visit planned for you today. It's an intimate, informative look into the daily lives of Greek women. It's amazing what women could accomplish while men spent all day trying to out-debate each other at assembly meetings. Their work should be far more appreciated on the whole, but we're going to acknowledge that now. Corinth was one of the largest cities in ancient Greece. It had an estimated population of 90,000 in my times, and much of that population was made up of women. This tour will shine a light on those women, and look at how they lived on a day-to-day -day basis. Look for me when you're done with your visit, and we can discuss things further. Young girls growing up in ancient Greek cities were usually raised by a nurse. They mostly stayed in the women's quarters of the house, the Gunaikon, where they spent their time spinning threads and weaving. While there is not much historical evidence of young girls at play, especially compared to boys, it was still known to happen. For example, an ancient terracotta group depicts two girls playing Ephedrismos, this was a competition to see who could strike an upright rock from afar using a pebble or ball. The game's loser had to close their eyes and carry the victor until they managed to touch the same rock with their hands.
For a young Greek woman, marriage was the culmination of their induction into society. The average life expectancy for women was about 40 years, so most marriages took place when the bride was 14 or 15 years old. The marriage did not require her consent either. Instead, she was passed on from the protection of her father to that of her husband. Married women were not technically citizens at the time and lacked the rights that came with official citizenship. However, they did receive a dowry that only they were allowed to spend. But in the event of a failed marriage, the dowry was returned to the bride's father. After the marriage was consummated, the woman's status changed from being a maiden to a bride. She remained a bride until the birth of her first child, wherein she officially became a woman. Women living in ancient Greek cities were essentially forbidden from participating in political life, and most aspects of their lives were controlled by men. Their most important responsibilities were running the household and giving birth to children, preferably boys. Most of the time, women's excursions outside of the house were limited to visiting other female neighbors, as per custom. The few exceptions to this strict rule were weddings, funerals, and religious festivals involving women in prominent public roles. Making textiles was the main occupation of most Greek women. It was a woman's responsibility to manufacture clothing for each of her family members, as well as to weave other household textiles. Women with exceptional weaving skills were believed to make excellent wives, and weaving in general was seen as a very attractive quality. For example, Homer describes Odysseus's devoted wife Penelope as spending most of her days weaving at the loom. Similarly, many Greek vases depicting women weaving were combined with images of a woman holding a veil, which was seen as the symbol of a bride.
ancient Greek women cooked in their house's kitchen area. However, since their cooking equipment was small and portable, they also sometimes prepared meals in the central courtyard. This was also where women performed other domestic activities. These activities were rarely seen by visiting men or passers-by because the architecture of classical Greek houses facilitated the social norm that women should never be seen at work. The historian Strabo relays that the Temple of Aphrodite was one of Corinth's most famous landmarks. This was largely due to the temple's female patrons. These hetairai, as they were called, were donated to the goddess by both men and women. According to Strabo, the Temple of Aphrodite contributed greatly to Corinth's wealth. The hetairai were the temple's main attraction, and many visitors came to Corinth in search of their company for which they spent frequently and frivolously. Hello again, Wanderer. I hope your visit was an interesting one. Greek women lived very restricted lives compared to men, but throughout it all, they held on to their strength and dignity. Is there anything else you'd like to do? Feeling up for a test? Excellent. Let's begin with an easier question. What was the name of the women's quarters in a Greek home? The Iraeon was a temple dedicated to the goddess Hera. Try again. The Andron was actually the men's section of the house where they held their symbosia. Try another answer. Correct. The Yinekon was where young girls spent their days weaving and spinning threads. On to the next question. The Corinthian temple said to employ the Etera was dedicated to which god? Correct. Aphrodite was the goddess of love and passion, so it's only fitting her temple served such an amorous purpose. We're almost done. Just one more question. What was the name of Odysseus' wife? Yes, Penelope was Odysseus' loyal wife, who kept at her weaving while waiting for her husband to return from war. You passed the test, Wanderer. Congratulations. Then farewell, Wanderer, and thank you for visiting this great place.
Christ.
friend, and welcome to Olympia, home of the Olympic Games. My name is Varnavas, and I'm a ship captain. Don't be fooled by my eye. Though I've seen my share of combat, I mostly stick to trading these days. Well, trading and introducing visitors like you to wonderful sights like this. I've often dreamed of competing in the games. If my sight was better, my legs and arms were stronger, and my coin purse was fatter. But that is not what the gods want. So I continue making the best of the path they've laid out for me. We're standing in the main section of Olympia, where the Olympic Games themselves took place. Over the course of the festival, athletes competed against each other for prestige and glory to honor themselves and their cities. Enjoy your visit, friend. I'll check in when you're done to make sure you've been paying attention. The first day of the Olympic Festival began with a swearing-in ceremony for the participating athletes, trainers, and judges. The ceremony took place in front of the altar of Zeus Horkios, or Zeus of the Oath. Athletes would swear that they would follow the Olympic rules while judges promised to be fair and unbiased. Then the competitions began, starting with a contest between heralds and trumpeters over who would have the privilege of announcing the games. The first day's athletic competitions consisted of wrestling, running, and boxing events for the youngest athletes, aged 12 to 18. The second day began with a grand procession into the Hippodrome to celebrate the start of the popular equestrian events. The most anticipated and spectacular of these was the Quadriga, a four-horse chariot race. Horse racing events were unique in that the winner was not the most skilled jockey, but the owner of the fastest horse or chariot. The Spartan princess Kaniska once took advantage of this loophole to skirt the rule that women weren't allowed to compete and earned two Olympic victories in the process. The rule also allowed for occasionally strange results, like in 416 BCE, when the statesman Alcibiades entered seven chariots into a race and won first, second, and fourth place. After the equestrian competitions, the 40,000 spectators migrated to the stadium to watch the pentathlon events. When the day's events were over, funeral rites were performed for the hero Pelops, the mythical founder of the Olympic Games. The night ended with a celebratory feast and a great parade in honor of the day's victors.
Victory at the Olympic Games was one of the highest honors a mortal could achieve, and there were several ways to immortalize that honor. Some athletes had statues erected of themselves, while others commissioned poets to write them victory odes. Oral tradition was very important to the Greeks. These odes, called epinikia, were often composed by the finest poets in the land, such as Pindar, Simonides, and Bacchylides. They were usually played at banquets and celebrations attended by the triumphant athlete or upon his departure from Olympia. The pentathlon took place at the stadium on the second day. As its name implies, it was made up of five events. Discus throwing, javelin throwing, jumping, racing, and wrestling. There are several differences between the ancient version of events and their contemporary counterparts. For example, ancient long jumpers held weights in their hands to give them momentum to launch, since there was no run-up before the jump. Similarly, if an athlete won the first three events, they were immediately declared the winner, instead of being judged by their overall performance in all five events. Running events work the same as they do today, with the notable exception of all the athletes being nude. As for wrestling, competitors were not divided by weight class as they are today, but instead by age. The winner was the first to throw his opponent to the ground three times. Day three started with the most important event of the festival. A procession of Helenodikai, ambassadors, competitors, and animals made their way to the great altar in front of the Temple of Zeus. The animals were then offered as the official sacrifice of the festival. The afternoon of day three was dedicated to foot racing events. Running was the oldest event of the games, and in fact was the only event at the first Olympics. The main race was called the Stadion, which was a sprint of around 180 meters. The winner was granted the honor of lending his name to the four-year period between the games. This period was known as the Olympiad. The four years that followed the first games in 776 BCE were known as the Olympiad of Coroibus of Elis, the first Olympic champion. Once all the competitions were over, a public banquet was held in the Pretineon to celebrate the day's victors. Day four was mainly for combat events. Wrestling matches were held in the morning, followed by boxing and pancration. Pancration was a no-holds-barred mix between wrestling and boxing. Almost all moves were permitted, except for biting, poking the eyes or mouth, and striking the genitals. The event was very popular, and it was seen as the ultimate expression of strength and technique. Later on in the afternoon, there was a unique racing event called the Hoplitodromos, or race in armor. In this event, competitors wore a helmet and held a shield to simulate running in the battlefield. The Hellenodikai, or judges of the Greeks, were both the game's adjudicators and their organizers. They hailed from Elis, the city in charge of the sanctuary of Olympia, and new judges were elected each Olympiad. 
they had several responsibilities. Before the game started, they decided which athletes would be allowed to compete and supervise their training. They also drew lots to make the competition brackets. During the games themselves, they picked the winners and kept an eye out for foul play. For the latter, they were assisted by stick and whip-wielding umpires who stood near the athletes and punished them if they were caught cheating. Victory in Olympia was one of the most prestigious honors in all of Greece. Not only would victors be showered in glory in their home city, but their names would be known across Greece. The temptation to glory led some athletes to break their oath to Zeus and cheat. This could be dangerous, as there were many possible punishments should cheaters be caught. They could be disqualified and fined, or if they were caught cheating during a match, they would be beaten by nearby umpires. The most powerful deterrent of cheating, however, was shame. At the foot of Mount Kronios and on the way to the stadium were a group of bronze statues called Zanes, the plural of Zeus. These statues were inscribed with the names of the cheating athletes, how they cheated, and the fine that was imposed. The Zanes, which were funded by cheaters' fines, were strategically placed to be highly visible. Individuals or even entire cities could be found guilty of cheating. The Pretineion was the administrative center of the cult of Olympia and the Olympic Games. The building housed the sanctuary's priests as well as the game's officials. It was also used to stage the grand banquet held on the evening of the third day to honor victors. It also had a sacred function. Its central chamber was the location of the Fire of Hestia, a sacred flame that burned day and night. This fire was used to light the other altars around the sanctuary. This practice may have partially inspired the modern tradition of carrying the Olympic torch. Hello again! I hope you enjoyed your visit. 
with their spectacular events and lavish banquets, the Olympic Games were a feast for the senses. I am certain even Zeus himself was entertained by the festivities. Now, is there anything else you'd like to do? Wonderful! Let the mental Olympics begin. Let's start with an easy one. Which notable woman won an event in the Games? Correct! She won two equestrian events thanks to her savvy horse purchases. This next question is slightly more challenging. Which of the following is not a famous Greek poet? You are right! Vrasidas was a renowned Spartan general, and he didn't have time for rhymes and pretty words. Time for the final question. How many events were in the pentathlon. Yes, the Greek word for pende means five, and the pentathlon had five events. Well done, my friend. You truly possess a sharp mind. Very well. Safe travels, my friend. Welcome, friend, to this especially sacred part of the Olympian Sanctuary. This place is practically vibrating with divine energy. I feel like if I look over my shoulder right now, Zeus will be staring back at me. The sanctuary of Olympia was dedicated to Zeus, king of the gods. It had close connections to the divine, as you will see very soon. I'll come find you when you're done, and we can talk about what you've learned. This workshop was built for the renowned sculptor Phidias after his work on the Acropolis of Athens. In 435 BCE, Phidias came to Olympia to begin working on the great chrysolophantine statue of Zeus. He died five years later, shortly after completing his masterpiece. This grand statue would become one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Phidias's workshop was located right next to the Temple of Zeus. Its structure has been well preserved, mostly owing to its conversion to a church in the 5th century CE. Archaeologists have also discovered lots of ancient materials in the surrounding area, such as casting molds and sculpting tools. The most famous artifact, however, is a cup bearing an inscription that aggressively states, I belong to Phidias.
On the fifth and final day of the Olympic Games, victors attended a ceremony where they were crowned with olive wreaths and showered in flowers. The crowns came from the sacred olive tree of Zeus, which was planted near the god's temple. A young boy trimmed the branches with a golden sickle before giving them to the Helenodikai to turn into wreaths. After the crowning ceremony, it was time for great feasting and celebration. Pelops was both a legendary Greek hero and the mythical founder of the Olympic Games. According to legend, Pelops fell in love with the beautiful Hippodamia. Her father, Oinomaos, the king of Pisa, disapproved of their union. Having once heard a prophecy that he would be killed by his son-in-law, Oinomaos was known to challenge his daughter's suitors to chariot races, killing them when he won. Still. Pelops was determined to win Hippodamia's heart. Before the race, he enlisted the help of Poseidon, who gave him a golden chariot with four winged horses. Pelops was able to win both the race and the hand of his beloved, while Oinomaus was dragged to death by his horses. The start of this famous race was depicted on the eastern pediment of the Temple of Zeus.
The Herion was a temple dedicated to Hera. It is one of the oldest temples in the sanctuary, dating back to approximately 590 BCE. The structure included columns painted with images of women who won the Heraia, an athletic competition made up of running events. Every four years, 16 women were chosen to make a veil dedicated to Hera. These women also organized the competition, though they did not compete in it. The Heraia was unique for its focus on female athletes, in contrast to the male-exclusive Olympic Games. was the goddess of women, marriage, family, and childbirth. She ruled Mount Olympus as queen of the gods, along with her husband and brother Zeus. Many mythological stories paint her as being annoyed at Zeus's many lovers and illegitimate offspring. In Greek art, Hera is usually depicted as matronly and regal, often wearing a crown or sitting on a throne. She is also sometimes seen holding a pomegranate, a symbol of both fertility and death. Hera's cult was very popular across Greece, and Olympia even minted her image on its coinage.
One of the highlights of the Olympic Games was a ceremony that took place on the third day of the festival. It began with a procession of athletes, ambassadors, Helenodikai, and animals. The group made their way around the Altis until they arrived at the Temple of Zeus. Then the animals were brought in front of the altar of Zeus and offered as a sacrifice. This sacrifice was known as a hecatome, a word that originally described the sacrifice of 100 oxen. During the hecatome, the bones and legs of the animals were burned and carried to the top of a mound of ashes from previous sacrifices. Meanwhile, the meat of the animals was saved for a large banquet held later in the evening. The Olympic Games were dedicated to Zeus, and all the ceremonies and events were hosted in his honor. It is no surprise that the largest temple in the sanctuary was the Temple of Zeus. While most temples were restricted to priests, the Temple of Zeus welcomed all who visited Olympia. This openness was most likely meant to show off the gold and ivory statue of Zeus that stood within the temple's walls. The building also featured art depicting both versions of the Olympic Festival's founding myth. The eastern pediment showed a scene from the legendary race between Pelops and Oinomaos. The temple's metopes, meanwhile, showed the 12 labors of Heracles, the other mythical founder of the games. Zeus was the god of sky and thunder and king of the Olympians. He ruled the world from his home on Mount Olympus. The child of Cronus the Titan, Zeus overthrew his father and cast the Titans out in a great battle known as the Titanomachy. He had children of his own with his wife Hera, including Ares, Hephaestus, Hebe, and Ilithia. He also had many children without Hera, much to her consternation but there are too many to list here. Zeus was believed to have control over the lives of mortals, as his many epithets attest to. For example, his title Horkios made him a keeper of oaths, while Xenios was the name conferred to him as a protector of hospitality. In Greek art, Zeus was usually depicted holding a thunderbolt and sitting on a throne, befitting his position as king. The Temple of Zeus was home to the Chryselephantine statue of Zeus, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. The statue, made of gold, ivory, and wood, was sculpted by the renowned artist Phidias. At 13 meters tall, it was as impressive looking as it was difficult to maintain. Oil was used to protect the wood and ivory from cracking and to prevent general decay. While the statue does not exist today, it was thankfully described by Pausanias in great detail, so its legacy lives on.
again. I hope you enjoyed your visit and feel a little bit closer to the gods. Well, as close as a mortal can get. Is there anything else you'd like to do? Excellent. Let's see what you remember. Your first question is a simple one. Which goddess was Zeus's wife? Correct! Not only was Ida Zeus's wife, she was his sister as well. But let's move on to the next question. What kind of contest did Pelops win in his quest to marry Hippodamia? Yes! Pelops won a chariot race, thanks to Poseidon's help. And now, the final question. What was inscribed on the cup found near Phidia's workshop? Correct! Apparently, Phidias was very possessive of his things. Perhaps someone from the sanctuary kept stealing them. But I'm getting off track. Excellent work, friend! You honor the gods with your great wisdom. Farewell for now, my friend.
Greetings, my friend. Welcome to Arcadia, home of shepherds, sheep, and she uh, manure. I recently made an offer to buy some nearby farmland. Unfortunately, the owner refused, based on completely unsubstantiated rumors that I once burned down three farms in Kos. Can you believe it? I've never burned down a farm in my life. I may have once paid someone else to do so, but I assure you, my reasons were entirely acceptable and in the best interest of everyone involved. Arcadia was well known for its sublime natural vistas. Farmers and shepherds were seduced by its beauty, and it's easy to see why. I have to leave for now, but I'll meet you again when you finish your visit. Until then, my friend! Grain was a staple of the Greek diet, to the point where Homer referred to his compatriots as mortal eaters of bread. Grain farming was a meticulous process. Due to dry summers, artificial irrigation was impossible, so farmers had to rely on rainfall to water their crops. This gave them very narrow windows for sowing and harvesting. On a farm of this size, only half of the field would be planted every year, while the other half would lie fallow to avoid exhausting the soil. According to the poet Hesiod, the best time to sow grain was in autumn, and the best time to harvest it was in May. Fortunately, if farmers missed their opportunity, they also had a chance to plant millet in the spring. Before planting in a field, the land needed to be plowed a total of three times. Once in the spring to remove weeds, again in the summer to aerate the soil, and a final time in the winter to plant the seeds in the moist earth. The plow was pulled by two oxen, while the sowing of seeds was done by hand. After the seeds were planted, a boy turned the soil with a hoe to protect them from hungry birds. Once the sowing was finished, the farmers waited for winter rains to irrigate the field. They also prayed to the goddess of agriculture, Demeter, and her daughter, Persephone, in the hopes of being favored with a bountiful harvest come springtime. Grain was harvested in the spring using a curved knife called a sickle. With their backs to the wind, the reapers cut the plant stalks and left the sheaves behind before moving through the rest of the crop. Once the harvest was mowed, the sheaves were brought to the threshing floor. Animal husbandry was an important part of Greek agriculture. Farmers usually kept cattle, donkeys, sheep, goats, pigs, dogs, geese, and chickens. The animals mostly fed in pastures, but could also eat some of the farm's harvested grain, as well as damaged fruit and residue from olive oil and wine production. Livestock had several purposes. Their manure was used to fertilize the fields and their grazing helped remove weeds. Arcadia was a mountainous region believed to be the home of the god Pan, so farmers were more likely to keep sheep and goats than cattle.
Most farming tools were simple, handmade implements made of wood and occasionally tipped with iron. The most complicated tool was the plow, which was made up of several parts, including a beam, a drawbar, and a yoke. A two-pronged hoe, meanwhile, was used for tilling soil, and farmers also had tools for digging and weeding. After the sheaves were harvested, workers brought them to the threshing floor to extract the grain. Oxen or donkeys were hitched to a post in the center of the floor and guided around it, while workers threw sheaves under their hooves. The animals stomping forced the grain kernels out of their casings. Afterwards, the kernels were collected for the winnowing process. Winnowing helped separate the heavier grain seeds from the chaff. It began with using a wooden shovel to toss the grain. While in the air, the wind blew away the lighter chaff, leaving only the heavier grain. To remove the remaining chaff, the grain was tossed in a wooden basket called a lignon, which filtered the grain until only clean kernels remained. Barley, which was used to make flour, was different from other types of grain. Threshing was not enough to separate the barley from its husk. So instead, it was roasted in a specialized tool called a frigatron. After the barley was roasted, it was pounded with a mortar and pestle. The pounded grain was then ground into a meal using either a hand mill or a hopper mill. Grinding was boring work. So workers often lightened the mood with a mill song. Once the barley was completely ground, it was sieved using a wicker basket called a koskinon, making it ready for use. Grain storage areas needed to be dark, dry, cool, contained, and well ventilated to prevent the grain from spoiling. According to Hesiod, the preferred method of storing grain was in a pithos, the same container as Pandora's mythological box. Archaeological evidence suggests that Greeks may have also stored grain in small, walled structures woven from branches. Farms generally needed to store enough grain to sustain themselves for the year and seed corn for the next. Any surplus was either stored for a lean year or sold to markets for profit. Again, you must feel hungry. I know I would, spending all that time watching farmers working themselves to the bone. Now, what else can I do for you? If you say so, let's get started. According to Isiodos, what was the best month to start harvesting grain? Yes, spring was the ideal time for harvesting. Guess I'm not the only smart one around here. Time 
for another question. Which tool did reapers use to cut stocks? Yes, a sickle was a curved knife, making it ideal for harvesting sheaves of grain. Only one question left. Arcadia was believed to be the home of which god? Correct! Pan supposedly called the mountainous region his home. Incredible work, my friend. It's safe to say your mind is definitely more wheat than chaff. Safe travels, my friend. We'd better be seeing each other again soon. Welcome, traveler, to the ruins of Mikine. It is humbling to stand in the remnants of such a great civilization. 
Looking at these ruins, I am reminded that the past is never as far behind us as we think. These are the ruins of Mikine, center of the old Mikinian civilization. It was home to great warriors and heroes. In many ways, places like Athens and Sparta stand on the shoulders of its accomplishments. This tour will take you through its ruins and introduce you to its most important monuments, revealing its history in the process. I hope you enjoy yourself. I'll be waiting for you at the end of your visit. The Mycenaean civilization flourished in the Late Bronze Age between 1600 and 1200 BCE. During this period, it was mainly located in the Peloponnese and Central Greece. Mycenaeans were known for exploring distant lands. Notably, they battled the Hittite allied city of Walusa in a conflict that was believed to be the inspiration for Homer's Trojan War. But the Mycenaean people didn't only travel to fight, they learned much from their neighbors, the Minoans of Crete, such as how to write syllabic script on clay tablets. Such tablets provide evidence that Mycenaeans spoke an early form of Greek. They also tell of how great Mycenaean kings ruled over their warriors from opulent palaces in places like Mycenae, Thebes, and Knossos. The entrance to Agamemnon's citadel, or the Lion Gate, is one of the most iconic monuments in Mycenae. It is impressive for both its height and for the intimidating rendering on its relief, which depicts two lions standing on either side of a column. Unfortunately, the lions' heads, which were presumably made of a precious metal or higher quality stone, have been lost to time. The gate was most likely meant to greet a triumphant king returning home from successful military campaigns and to awe foreign visitors. When these shafts were discovered by archaeologist Heinrich Schliemann in 1876, he believed the six gold-filled graves to be connected with the family of the great king Agamemnon, even going so far as to proclaim a gold mask he found within to be the death mask of Agamemnon. However, this was refuted by later excavations, which showed that the 19 bodies buried in the shafts dated back to a few hundred years before Agamemnon was even born. In fact, at the time of the body's burial, the Lion Gate and the Citadel Walls had not even been built yet. It's estimated that the people in the graves were members of the first Mycenaean dynasty. The graves later became a place of worship for Mycenaean kings who raised walls to protect them. These walls helped preserve several incredible artifacts, including women's jewelry, death masks, and masterfully crafted weapons.
By 1250 BCE, Mycenae was at the height of its power, and its living quarters and workshops were numerous. Houses were built everywhere, from the top of the palace's hill near the king's residence, to the slopes and terraces within the walls, to the nearby hills outside the citadel. At one point, the citadel's walls even had to be enlarged to make room for more quarters. The people who lived inside the citadel were those with high status in either the military, religious, or administrative sectors of the kingdom. This is reflected by the ceramic and metal vessels inside the houses, as well as their painted plastered walls. A traveler seeking an audience with the king would have first ascended a steep ramp from the Lion Gate to the Citadel's summit. Here, they would have walked into the palatial complex through a grand entrance called the Propylon. Once inside, their gaze would immediately be drawn to the palace's main hall, a monumental area known as the Megaron. The vividly decorated Megaron, which glittered with precious objects and colorful frescoes in its heyday, was where the king would have received the traveler. If the king was feeling generous, he would have shared with the visitor the palace's most marvelous feature, its commanding and majestic view, which stretched from the plain of Argolis to the gleaming Aegean Sea. It was in this palace where a legendary Mycenaean king like Agamemnon would have held court. According to Homer and other poets, Agamemnon led the Greeks in the sack of Troy. Stories say that he was a fearsome warrior on par with Achilles, but also an overly ambitious and arrogant ruler. He sacrificed his own daughter, Ephigenia, to convince Artemis to grant his ships passage to Troy. After conquering the city, he returned to Mycenae with mounds of riches and a Trojan named Cassandra as his concubine. Agamemnon's wife, Clytemnestra, was not pleased with her husband's sacrifice of their daughter. She plotted to murder her husband out of anger. The plot was successful, and depending on the version of the story, Agamemnon was either murdered in his bath by Clytemnestra or killed by his cousin, Agisthus, during a banquet.
You've completed the tour. I trust it was an eye-opening experience. Though it did not last, Mekine was a sort of precursor to what would eventually become the Greek civilization we know today. It's important we remember them, if only to avoid repeating their mistakes. Now, what else would you like to do? Then let's begin. First, I have quite a simple question. Which ancient city may have been the inspiration for Homer's depiction of Troy? No, the Meginians who were at war with Troy in the first place. Yes, the Mekinians' conflict with the city of Wilusa allegedly inspired Homer's Trojan War. Now, for the second question. Agamemnon sacrificed his daughter Iphigenia to convince which god to allow him to proceed to Troy. Yes, Agamemnon sacrificed Iphigenia to reconcile with Artemis, who then allowed his ships to pass to Troy. Now, one last question. What was the name of Agamemnon's Trojan concubine? No, Clytemnestra was Agamemnon's wife. Try a different answer. Correct. Following the sack of Troy, Agamemnon sailed home with a Trojan prophetess named Cassandra. You've studied the ruins well, traveler. Then, I suppose this is farewell. At least for now. Safe travels.
Welcome to Argos, traveler. I have always admired the dedication of Greek metalworkers. Without them, we would not have the inspiring monuments that stir the hearts of Greek citizens everywhere. This is Argos, one of the oldest cities in Greece. The Argives were an ingenious people, famous for innovations in areas like military tactics. However, what they were most renowned for was their metallurgic artistry, especially with bronze. I hope you enjoy yourself. Look for me at the end of your visit. The area that would become Argos was inhabited as early as the third millennium BCE, but it was in the seventh century BCE that it officially became a city-state. One of Argos's major pillars was its metallurgical industry. As far back as the 8th century BCE, the city was famed for making products like long dress pins and tripod cauldrons, as well as impeccable body armor. In addition to their technical excellence, the Argives were also creative, as seen in their masterful bronze sculpting which became prominent in the city during the 6th and 5th century BCE. Bronze is an alloy composed of 90% copper and 10% tin. Because of this, copper and tin needed to be smelted and combined to create the material needed for sculpting. After the bronze alloy was formed, it was melted in special furnaces. They required a tremendous amount of fuel and were usually supplied with charcoal made from specific types of wood. It's possible they were also coated with a protective lining of clay which would have been sensible given the melting point of bronze is approximately 950 degrees Celsius. Once the bronze was melted and collected, the furnaces were dismantled and dumped. In the 8th century BCE, most small-scale statues were molded using a complicated and lengthy method called solid lost wax casting. From the 7th century BCE onwards, metal workers adopted the more efficient hollow lost wax casting. At its core, this process involved using sculpting models from wax, making molds over these models, then filling the molds with bronze to produce the desired shapes. The process was advantageous because it saved on materials, produced lighter statues, and reduced the chance of possible defects. Once all the pieces of the sculpture were molded, they were welded together and subjected to the cold working process. This process involved repairing the sculpture's flaws by filling any holes and cracks with specifically measured bronze patches. Afterwards, the sculpture was scraped, chiseled and polished until it was deemed satisfactory. Decorative details like hair, eyebrows and moustaches 
were added with the use of a sharp tool. Eyes, which could be inset with ivory, glass, or silver, were attached to their sockets using a resinous kind of glue. Teeth and fingernails were inlaid with silver, and lips and nipples with copper. These small touches added color and contributed to the sculpture's lifelike appearance. Bronze sculptures have a long and varied history in Greece. During the geometric period of 900 to 700 BCE, the sculptures mainly depicted idealized heroes, charioteers, and horses, and most of them were dedicated to sanctuaries. The orientalizing period followed in the 7th century BCE. During this time, Greeks began adopting sculpting techniques from the east and the depicted statues expanded to include mythological creatures like griffins and sphinxes. The archaic period saw statues that reflected a better understanding of human anatomy, which eventually culminated in the realistic and powerful human sculptures of the Hellenistic period. Argos was the home of Polykleitos, one of the most famous sculptors in ancient Greece. His works, like the Doriphorus and Diadomenos, as well as his treatise on sculpting called the Canon, had a massive impact on the art as a whole, particularly in regards to ideal body proportions. Sadly, the original versions of Polykleitos' sculptures have been lost, along with most bronze statues from antiquity. As time went on, many bronze statues were melted down to be recycled in things like weapons, ammunition, and even church bells. Because of this, marble copies from the Roman period are our best evidence of the masterpieces of Greek sculpture. I see you have completed your tour. I trust you have a new appreciation for Greek sculptures after learning of the heart and soul that was poured into each step of their creation. Now, what else would you like to do? Then let us dive right in. Here is your first question. Which era of sculpting came first? The Hellenistic period began in 323 BCE, following several other eras. Try again. The classical period lasted from 480 to 323 BCE, making it relatively new in the grand scheme of things. But please, try another answer. The orientalizing period lasted for most of the 7th century BCE. It introduced Eastern sculpting techniques to the Greek world. But it was not the earliest era. Try a different answer. Correct. The geometric period lasted from 900 to 700 BCE and mostly featured small-scale statues and statuettes of heroes and horses. On to the second question. Bronze was an alloy composed of which two metals? Yes, 
To get the bronze required for sculpting, metal workers first needed to smelt copper and tin. One last question for you. Which renowned sculptor was a native of Argos? Yes, Polyclitos was based in Argos and had an enormous impact on the art of sculpting. You've done well, Traveller. Your knowledge of metalwork is astounding. Then, farewell, Traveller. May we meet again soon.
Welcome, traveler, to the sanctuary of Asclepios, a place of rest and healing. The sanctuary of Asclepios is an amazing place, even for those with only a passing interest in medicine. It was a fascinating location, combining the mystical, religious, and scientific. And if someone happened to pass out, they'd luckily be surrounded by skilled physicians. This is the sanctuary of Asclepios, the god of medicine. It was here that the sick and weary came, seeking cures for their ailments. Sometimes the medical practitioners provided the cures, and sometimes the healing came from the gods themselves. This tour will help explain the inner workings of the sanctuary, as well as the unique way the Greeks approached medicine. I hope you enjoy yourself. I'll be waiting for you at the end of your visit. The ill and infirm came to this sanctuary to pray and offer sacrifices to Asclepios, the god of medicine. According to myth, Asclepius was once a mortal physician who eventually became a god. He had many sanctuaries across Greece, but the most famous was in Epidaurus. When pilgrims passed through the entrance of the sanctuary, they could read this inscription. When you enter the abode of the god which smells of incense, you must be pure, and thought is pure when you think with piety. Medical steles constituted a sort of hub between medicine, religion, and the divine. They were slabs with inscriptions that praised Asclepios's virtues and merit and described his methods of healing. The inscriptions relayed the dreams patients had within the abaton, one of the most important buildings in the sanctuary. The steles outlined the patient's name, their disease, and how they were cured by Asclepios. They were probably written by the sanctuary's priests, or at least under the priest's supervision. Asclepius was a complex deity. In addition to being a god, he was also a trained physician and disciple of the centaur Chiron. In ancient Greece, religion was inseparable from rites, processions, and sacrifices. This was no different in Epidaurus, and visitors to Asclepios's sanctuary needed to prepare themselves accordingly. Pilgrims cleaned themselves in order to be pure, then offered Asclepios food like honey cakes, cheesecakes, baked meats, and figs. The food was placed on the sanctuary's holy table, where it was presumably later taken by priests. After the preliminary offerings, visitors were allowed to enter the Abaton, where they would hopefully encounter Asclepios in a dream. Medical steles also mention that healed patients sometimes gave additional offerings to Asclepios as thanks for being cured. Medical Steve, they the same ask.
Asclepius was originally born a mortal and was the product of an affair between the god Apollo and a mortal, Coronis. Apollo killed Coronis after discovering she had been unfaithful and ordered her body burned on a funeral pyre. However, he rescued his unborn child from Coronis's womb before the fire consumed her body. Apollo gave the baby to the centaur Chiron, who raised Asclepios and taught him to practice medicine. Over time, Asclepios became so skilled in the art of healing, he could even raise the dead. This angered Zeus, who sent Asclepios to Hades with a thunderbolt. Apollo retaliated by killing the Cyclopes responsible for making Zeus's thunderbolts. Then, Zeus revived Asclepios, making him immortal and deifying him in the process. In sculptures, pottery, mosaics, and coins, Asclepius was portrayed holding a staff intertwined with a sacred snake. The staff is a symbol of medicine that still endures to this day. Epitodian was the priest's residence. As the link between patients and the gods, priests were essential to the operation of the sanctuary. They were often elected into the priesthood for one-year periods, but could also buy themselves a position if they were wealthy enough. In addition to interpreting patients' dreams in the abaton, priests both supervised and performed sacrifices and rituals. During these functions, they were usually clad in white. The abaton was built in the northern boundary of the sanctuary, where it surrounded a sacred well whose water was believed to have therapeutic properties. The abaton was where pilgrims went for incubation or dream rituals. Details of the incubation ritual have been described in unearthed medical steles. They were also noted in Aristophanes's play Plutos, which featured a more comedic view of the process. Incubation was the dream ritual pilgrims experienced in the Abaton. After completing the necessary preliminary rituals, pilgrims were allowed to enter the sacred building, where they lay prone. As they took in the smell of burning incense, the sanctuary's priests extinguished the oil lamps and asked them to sleep in silence. Once they were asleep, Asclepios would appear in their dreams and give his medical advice. The advice included diet and treatment recommendations, as well as requests for specific offerings or religious rituals. 
Upon waking up, priests interpreted the patient's dreams, unless a patient had been miraculously healed in their sleep. However, if a patient was completely beyond help, they were removed from the abaton. This was to adhere to a ritual law that stated that no one could die or be born within the building. I see you've completed the tour. I hope you enjoyed your time in the sanctuary. As you can see, gods and miracles were just as important to the healing process as medicine was. Now, what else would you like to do? Excellent. Here is your first question. Which mythical creatures made Zeus's thunderbolts? Correct. Zeus's thunderbolts were crafted by Cyclops. On to the second question. What was the name of the building where incubation occurred? Yes, pilgrims entered the Abaddon to undergo a dream ritual in the hopes of curing their ailments. One final question for you. Who was Asclepius's father? Yes, Apollo was Asclepius's father, and his mother was a mortal named Coronis. You've proven you know the sanctuary inside and out. Well done. Very well. May your quest for knowledge be fruitful and fulfilling. Welcome to Pylos, traveler. This area, along with the nearby island of Sphacteria, were important battlegrounds during the Peloponnesian War. I always find it a shame that such lovely-looking places were exposed to so much violence. It's difficult to take pleasure in relaxing on the sand, knowing how stained it is with blood. The Peloponnesian War was a great conflict between rivals Sparta and Athens. It lasted many years, 
and cost a great number of lives on both sides. The battles of Pyrrhus and Sphacteria occurred almost one after the other and culminated with one of the most surprising outcomes in the entire war. Ah, but I will not spoil it for you. You'll have to experience it on your own. I'll wait for you at the end of the tour. Since 431 BCE, the Peloponnesian War had been raging between Athens, Sparta, and their allies, with neither side gaining much ground. But in 425 BCE, an Athenian general named Demosthenes changed that. After a storm forced his fleet to stop in Pylos, Demosthenes realized a military presence in the area would give them an advantage against Sparta. Unfortunately, the fleet strategists did not believe him and left Demosthenes and Pylos with five triremes and 1,000 men. The Spartans, meanwhile, were too busy celebrating a religious festival to notice the enemy on their doorstep. Once Sparta discovered the Athenian presence on Pylos, the Spartan king Aegis mustered his troops and fleet. Sparta then descended on Demosthenes' outpost, attacking from both the sea and the mainland. The Athenian general had to mount a hasty defense. He pulled his boats back to the foot of the ramparts and fixed them in place with stakes, providing extra cover. Then, going against all the established rules of battle, he descended with his hoplites to fight on the rocky shore, where he believed the Spartans would disembark. His gamble paid off, and the Spartans did indeed attempt to land at this location, though Demosthenes' forces made them hesitate. One of the Spartan leaders, Brasidas, decided to make the first move by ramming the rocks with his boat, exclaiming, it's only a few planks. He paid for his actions when his shield slipped into the sea after descending from his boat, leaving him open to many blows. The battle raged on into the night and continued to the next day, remaining locked in a stalemate. However, on the evening of the second day, Athenian reinforcements arrived. The sudden arrival of the Athenian fleet stacked the odds in Athens' favor. The fleet decided to hold off their attack until the next day, when they swarmed the Spartan ships. They successfully captured five enemy ships and damaged many others, cutting off access to the nearby island of Sphacteria. Then, to add insult to injury, the Athenians raised a stake hung with weapons they'd captured from the Spartans, including the shield of Brasidas. Meanwhile, the 420 Spartans on Sphacteria were trapped, and Sparta was completely helpless to rescue them. With 420 of their men trapped on Sphacteria, 
Sparta needed to reevaluate their position. The Spartans on the island were essentially the Athenians' hostages, and Sparta could not move to rescue or resupply them without putting their lives in danger. In an effort to save the trapped soldiers, the Spartan leadership negotiated an immediate truce with the Athenian strategists. Sparta agreed to hold back its fleet and halt their attacks on Pylos. And in return, the Athenians permitted them to send supplies to their men. In the meantime, Sparta sent ambassadors to Athens to try and negotiate a better deal. The hasty truce greatly humiliated Sparta, as they were forced to recognize just how helpless their infantry was in the face of an Athenian fleet. To bargain for the safety of their men, Sparta sent ambassadors to Athens to propose a cessation of hostilities. The ambassadors tried to emphasize that their situation was not a result of strategic incompetence or lack of strength, but rather plain bad luck. According to them, the Spartans on Sphacteria did not deserve to suffer further because they were trapped through no fault of their own. These statements provoked the ire of Cleon, a popular Athenian politician known for his popular speeches. Cleon insisted that the terms of negotiations be discussed openly before the assembly and the Athenian people instead of in private. The Spartan ambassadors were not as comfortable with public speaking as the Athenians, so they decided to leave. Following the failed attempts of the Spartan ambassadors, hostilities resumed. Back in Athens, Cleon took matters into his own hands. After being elected general, or strategos, he left to join the ongoing battle, accompanied by javelin-armed infantry and archers. With renewed strength and numbers, the Athenians landed on Sphacteria and engaged their enemy. The battle was hard fought, but they eventually managed to surround the remaining Spartans. It was then that Cleon invited the Spartans to surrender, as he hoped to return to Athens with prisoners. The Spartans were exhausted after spending 72 days on the island, so they accepted Cleon's offer and laid down their arms. A Spartan capitulation had previously been unheard of, and the news of their surrender echoed throughout Greece like thunder. The Spartans' capitulation completely changed the course of the Peloponnesian War. Athens used their new prisoners of war as leverage and threatened to execute them if Sparta ever returned to pillage their lands. This gave the Athenians the freedom to conduct their own raids, which were aided further by their eventual seizing of the island of Kythera. Sparta tried to negotiate for peace, but were unsuccessful. Cleon, meanwhile, was emboldened by his victory and continued to gain popularity with the Athenian people. Popularity that translated to power. I hope you enjoyed learning about the battles of Pylos and Sphacteria. The battles were hard fought by both sides, but Athens' victory gave them an enormous boost in morale. It encouraged them to be more aggressive, and it was some time before Sparta recovered from the aftershocks of their historic surrender. Now, is there anything else you'd like to do? I'm happy to oblige. Let's begin.
Where were the Mostenius and his fleet forced to land during a storm? The Mostenis landed close to the island, but not directly on it. Try again. Yes, the Mostenis landed at Pylos, where he was inspired to set up an outpost. On to the second question. Which famous Athenian argued with the peace-seeking Spartan ambassadors? Correct. Cleon demanded the terms of the peace be discussed in front of the Athenian assembly which greatly dissuaded the ambassadors. One last question. Which Spartan general rammed Pylos with his ship? Correct. Gracidas ordered his ship to ram the rocks and lost his shield in the process. You've passed the test. Well done, traveler. Then I will say farewell. Though I hope our paths will cross again someday.
Welcome, visitor, to where Spartan boys become Spartan men. I can't help but be reminded of the boy I used to be. I wonder what that boy would think if he saw me today. Would he be proud? Intimidated? Or would he pity the tired old man standing in front of him? But such thoughts are meaningless. Let us move on. The Agogi was Sparta's strict education system. The strenuous regimen took in the young boys and then reshaped them until nothing was left but the strength, intelligence, and resolve of a perfect Spartan citizen. I will find you once your visit has ended, and we will talk further. Until then, visitor. Sparta was a Greek city located in the Peloponnese. It differed from other cities at the time in that it had no walls. Sparta originated as four neighboring villages, Patani, Limnes, Mezoa, and Sinisora, all of which shared the same political, military, and religious life. After two wars with the Mycenaeans, the city's territory expanded even further. By the 5th century BCE, they allegedly controlled almost half of the Peloponnese. The Agoge was the military training and education program undergone by Sparta's male youth. Grooming men for war was one of the city's main priorities. Boys began their training at the young age of seven and completed it when they were 30. It has been said that Spartan infants were inspected for weakness shortly after birth. If they were deemed too sickly, they were thrown into chasms. However, this information remains unproven. The healthy boys were considered suitable for training. When they came of age, they were removed from their families and were placed into service of the state. Their education included subjects like reading, writing, and even music, but was mostly focused on tough military exercises meant to turn the boys into efficient soldiers. The Agoge was divided into three cycles, one for boys aged 7 to 12, one for adolescents aged 12 to 20, and one for men aged 20 to 30. Each cycle included different exercises for refining the body and mind. Sparta played a large role in defeating the Persians during the Greco-Persian Wars in the 5th century BCE. They held their King Leonidas's glorious death at the Battle of Thermopylae in particularly high esteem. Because Leonidas was killed in battle, Sparta believed he died a good death and showed incredible bravery, qualities to be held as a model for all Spartans. This idealized bravery was embedded in the city's collective memory and was the main quality people strove for in the Agoge.
The first cycle of the agoge focused on boys aged 7 to 12. Each of the boys had shaved heads and wore light clothing. They walked everywhere barefoot, swam the Erotus River all year long, slept on reeds, and participated in cult rituals for Artemis or Thea. The boys were grouped into herds, or agoli, and were supervised by older adolescents. Once they reached the age of 12, they entered the second cycle of the agoge, which aimed to integrate them into the society of citizen soldiers. The Agoge's second cycle included boys aged 12 to 20. When they reached the age of 20, the young men were dubbed Erenes and could officially serve as hoplites in the Spartan army. Until the age of 30, Spartan men lived in communal mess halls called Suskenia. From the age of 22 onward, they were permitted to start a family, but 30 was viewed as a more appropriate age to get married. Spartan men served in the military until they turned 60 when they were designated as elders, or garantes. However, many were known to continue serving anyway, such as King Archimedes III, who fought in the army until he was killed in battle at the age of 62. All adult male Spartans participated in communal meals called Sicitia. The attending Spartans contributed different kinds of food on a monthly basis, in addition to a small sum of money to pay for meat. Each man was entitled to one portion of a meal, with the exception of the kings, who received two portions. Sicitia attendance was mandatory for every Spartan fortunate enough to be part of the group. The meals had great political significance. According to Xenophon and Plutarch, the Sicidia was designed to foster a sense of equality between citizens. It also demonstrated the self-restraint and moderation of Spartan society. But in reality, the Sicidia only increased the differentiation between the rich and the poor. Those who could not afford to contribute to the communal food not only missed their meals, but also lost their right of citizenship. Your tour has ended. As you have seen, the Arogi was not for the weak or faint of heart, but it did its job in producing skilled warriors and shrewd citizens. What else would you like to do? So you think you are ready for a test? Very well. Let us see how you fare. First, a simple question. The Arogi was made up of how many cycles? Correct. The Agogi was divided into three cycles. One for boys, aged 7 to 12, one for adolescents, aged 12 to 20, and one for men, aged 20 to 30. Next question. How many meal portions were kings entitled to at Sicitia? Yes, Spartan kings had the right to double portions. One final question. When were Spartans allowed to grow mustaches? Yes, once a Spartan man was over 30, 
he was allowed to adorn his face with a glorious display of manhood. Impressive, visitor. You should be proud. Safe travels, visitor. Welcome to Laconia, visitor. You're here to learn about Spartan society, yes? Then I won't stop you. Sparta is a glorious place, and you should feel honored to be here. Honored, and perhaps somewhat frightened. Sparta had a unique hierarchy especially compared to the rest of Greece. Everyone had their place, and you will soon learn what those places were. I will find you again once your visit has ended. Until then, visitor. Spartan society was structured around austerity, self-sufficiency, and a hostility towards foreign elements. It was divided into three social classes, citizens, perioikoi, and helots. Citizens were called Spartans or homoioi. They were free men and women with mostly equal rights and wealth, though their contributions to political life were extremely limited. The perioikoi lived in surrounding areas under Spartan control. They cultivated the land and were primarily merchants and craftsmen. They were also part of the army, and their lands were the first line of defense in the event of a hostile attack. Helots were Sparta's lowest class. They were people who had lost their freedom to the Spartans, and they served the city as slaves. Helots were considered property instead of people. As a result, they had no political or civil rights. Helots made up the majority of Sparta's population. According to Polydeuces, they lingered between slavery and freedom. Two elements made Helots differ from other slaves. They were allowed to form their own families, and they were publicly owned by the city of Sparta instead of private citizens. Because Helots were deemed public property, they could not be sold as merchandise. They mostly worked to cultivate the land, but also fought in wars alongside the Spartans. While they gave the fruits of their labor to Sparta, they also kept a fair part of it for themselves. This practice allowed some helots to make enough money to buy their own freedom. Alternatively, if a helot served the state well enough in military campaigns, they could also be granted civil rights. The founding of Sparta is dated around the 9th century BCE. Historical information about the city is limited, but it was known to extend into the region of Laconia. Over time, Sparta started encroaching on the territory of Messenia, eventually leading to war. 
Sparta gained more land in this conflict, which they divided between their citizens and the Perioikoi. The aftermath of the Second Mycenaean War, from 640 to 620 BCE, then divided the population into three groups, the Homoioi, the Perioikoi, and the Helots. The Helots of Laconia mostly respected Sparta's rule and did not cause much trouble. However, Helots from Mycenae supposedly resisted the Spartans, although sources can only confirm one revolt for certain, which occurred in Mycenae in 464 BCE. During the 5th century BCE, Helots were quite active in the army, especially during the Peloponnesian War. They served as hoplites on land and as rowers during naval battles. In both cases, they gave Sparta an important... Although many ancient sources say Spartans had a hostile relationship with Helots, they were much more likely to treat them better in times of war. For example, when 300 Helots and 120 elite Spartans were captured by Athens during the Battle of Sphacteria in 425 BCE, the Spartans promised the Helots their freedom if they served them well in combat. Similarly, around the same time, the Spartan general Brasidas fought a battle alongside 700 Helots. Impressed by their courage and loyalty, Brasidas later freed them all and allowed them to join the Perioikoi. Perioikoi were another group of Sparta's population. They lived not in the city itself, but in its surrounding areas. The Perioikoi were never hostile against the Spartans. In fact, both groups together were known by the collective name Lacedaemonians. Perioikic cities had their own autonomy and sanctuaries, but they were always bound to Sparta. They were allowed to develop their own local laws and economies, but could never reach a level of prosperity that rivaled their parent state. I see you finished. I hope you have a better appreciation for Spartan society. Nothing we do is without a reason, and every man, woman, and child has a role to play. What would you like to do? <laughs> is that so? Then let us begin. During which battle were Elots promised their freedom? Yes. In the Battle of Stacteria, a group of elite Spartans promised to free their accompanying Elots if they helped the Spartans during a siege. Next question. 
Which of the following is another name for Spartan citizens? Spartan citizens were also called Omi, which meant equals. One final question. Which Spartan general freed 700 elots? Correct. Brasidas freed 700 elots as a reward for their exemplary military service. You passed. I'm impressed. Then you may leave. Farewell, visitor. Greetings, visitor. You stand in Sparta's political center, where all of the city's most important decisions were made. You should feel honored. Spartans may be unequaled on the battlefield, but some situations are better solved by a meeting of minds than a clash of swords. Not many, mind you, but some. Sparta's political system was unique in the Greek world. While Athenians wasted hours on end whining and wagging their tongues at each other, Spartan kings made their decisions swiftly and deliberately. They preferred action over words. Come find me again when you finish your visit. We will speak more then. Farewell. Sparta's political system differed from most of Greece's. One of its most distinctive features was that it was ruled by two kings. These kings belonged to two separate dynasties, the Europontids and the Aegeads, both of which were said to be descended from Heracles. Both kings shared equal powers, and disputes between them required the intervention of special magistrates known as ephors. However, if one of the kings were more charismatic or experienced, they could influence the weaker king's choices. Spartan kings had several responsibilities and functions. As lifetime magistrates, they were technically Sparta's priests and strategists, and their duties encompassed everything from politics to justice. Originally, both kings would lead military campaigns in times of war. However, from 507 BCE onwards, only one of the two kings could be head of the army. On the battlefield, kings were accompanied by 300 elite soldiers for protection. But being a king wasn't only about working and fighting, 
they enjoyed special privileges as well. Spartan kings lived at the expense of the city, owned royal estates in the surrounding Perioikic cities, and received the majority of the spoils of war. When they passed away, they were buried with special honors, and the population mourned them for a period of ten days. The kings of Sparta enjoyed many important religious honors. They were in charge of sacrifices, both during military campaigns and at home. The kings received double portions of the meat at all communal meals, and they were also the first to pour libations. They also personally conducted public sacrifices as priests, which helped remind their subjects of their divine connection to Heracles and Zeus. The ephors, or overseers, were five magistrates elected by the Spartan assembly. They were chosen from among Spartan citizens over 30 and served for one year with no possibility of re-election. The ephors played a large part in administrating the city and were considered the most democratic agents in the Spartan political system. They had judicial power and ordered the dispatching of the Spartan army during wars. They also met and negotiated with representatives from other states, in addition to running the agoge, the Spartan education system. While not as powerful as the two kings, the ephors still held great sway over Sparta's affairs. The Gerousia was the Spartan Council of Elders. It was made up of the two current kings, as well as 28 elders called Gerontes. They were Spartan citizens over the age of 60, the cutoff age for military duty. They were elected for life by the Spartan Assembly. The Gerousia, similar to Athens' Boule, handled legislative and financial matters. It could submit bills and motions to the assembly, and could also cancel assembly decisions with the power of veto. To ensure that the right of veto did not weaken the assembly, ephors were introduced to keep the Gerousia in check and maintain a steady balance of power. This allowed Sparta to include more just elements in its political system.
The Spartan Assembly, or the Appella, was made up of Spartan citizens who were over 30 years old. Its exact meeting place remains unknown, but it was presided over by a special member of the ephors called the eponymous ephor. The Appella had limited authority, since any decision it made could be overruled by the Gerousia. But thanks to the efforts of the ephors, it still played an important role in Spartan society. The Appella dealt with topics like foreign affairs, war declarations, peace negotiations, and more. They also elected ephors and Gerousia members, and could both grant political rights to foreigners and remove them from Spartan citizens. Unlike the myriad sources on the functions of the Athenian assembly, the exact details of the Appella's decision-making process are unknown. I see you finished. I hope you feel more knowledgeable about the inner workings of Spartan politics. Our way of ruling was not conventional, to say the least. But it served our purpose as well. What would you like to do? Are you? We shall see. Let's begin. What was the name of the Spartan Assembly? Correct. The Spartan Assembly was known as the Appella. Question two. How many members did the Yerosia have? There were 28 Yerontes on the Council of Elders, but they weren't the only members of the Yerosia. Keep trying. Yes, the Yerosia consisted of 28 Yerontes and the two kings of Sparta. Last question. What was the name of the Spartan education program? Correct. Our rigorous education program was called the Agogi, and it was overseen by the Air Force. You've done well, Visitor. Very well. Farewell, Visitor. May your travels be safe and carefree.
my friend. Welcome to Kithira, where clothes are dyed and noses are assaulted by disgusting smells. I think it smells terrible, and I can't wait to get out of here. The colors are pretty, though. This little island was where dyers brought all the color to Greek fashion through an intensely stinky procedure. This tour will reveal the steps it took for workers to brew the dye. Try not to step in any mollusk guts as you enjoy your visit. I promise I'll meet you at the end of your tour. See you soon, my friend! In Greece, fabric and clothing were colored using natural dyes from shellfish, insects, and plants. Skilled craftsmen across the Greek world extracted dyes from these sources and combined them with other substances to create a variety of colors. The dyeing process supposedly produced incredibly pungent smells, and ancient writers would often comment on the stink in their works. Murex is the generic name for three species of mollusks that reside in the Mediterranean. The substance they secrete was used by craftsmen to create the most expensive dyes in the ancient world, the most famous of which was Tyrian purple. Fishing techniques varied depending on the type of mollusk. In shallow waters, fishermen could simply dive and catch the mollusks, but they set traps if the water was too deep. Being carnivorous, murex were often lured using dead animal flesh as bait. It was imperative that the mollusks be captured alive, as they only secreted the precious purple liquid needed for dyes upon death. The purple liquid that made up most dyes came from a gland in the murex. To collect it, workers would either crack open the mollusk's shell with a knife, or if it was smaller, crush it with a stone. Each mollusk only produced a small amount of liquid, and thousands of them were needed to produce even a gram of the substance. Because of this, captured mollusks were usually kept alive in seawater immersed baskets until enough had accumulated to produce a satisfactory amount of dye. The mollusk glands were mixed with salt and left to decompose for three days. Afterwards, the resulting mash was placed in a vat, where it boiled until it was thickened and reduced to one sixteenth of its original volume. The dyers stirred this mixture and removed any impurities. This process produced the foul odor so reviled by ancient writers. Dyers checked the hue of the purple liquid by dipping in raw wool. 
The hue could be changed by adjusting the temperature of the liquid and by soaking the wool for different periods of time, with longer soaking producing deeper shades. The wool was dyed once before spinning and again before weaving to ensure it maintained its color. While Murex purple dyed wool easily, it did not adhere as well to other fabrics, such as linen. Most Greek garments were made from rectangular fabric that was rarely cut or sewn. They were normally folded around the body with girdles, pins and buttons. Dyeing served to give the garments a more unique style. Decorations were also widely used and were either woven or painted on. They depicted things like animals, human figures and mythological scenes. Textile manufacturing and trade was one of the most lucrative businesses in classical Athens. Textiles were made of either wool or linen, with wool being the most common. Women produced the garments worn in domestic life, although some men ran professional workshops that fulfilled the same need. Other textiles were made by slaves and laborers under the supervision of master weavers, fullers and dyers. Clothes didn't just keep people warm. They were used as a way to communicate social identities like gender, status, and ethnicity. These could be expressed through garments and accessories, but also jewelry, hairstyles, perfumes, and cosmetics. Wealthy Greeks usually had garments of the highest quality, and all their accessories were decorated with gold, silver, or gemstones. Parasols and fans were also an important part of elite fashion and were usually carried by accompanying slaves. Hey, The most common Greek garments were the peplos, the keton, and the hymation. The peplos, typically worn by women, was a body-length cloth. It was folded back on itself and worn draped over the body and pinned over the shoulders. The keton was a long garment with sleeves. Ankle-length ketones were normally worn by women, while men wore shorter versions of the garment. A hymation was a mantle that was worn over both the keton and the peplos. Outside of daily life, there were also specialized clothes worn only in exceptional situations like weddings and religious ceremonies. See you again, my friend. I bet your clothes feel heavier now that you know how many mollusks were killed to dye them. 
But let's change the subject, yes? What else can I do for you? Then let's get right into it, starting with this question. Which purple dye was the most famous? Yes, the purple created from murex secretions was one of the most expensive and well-known dyes in the world. Here's another question. How did workers check the dye's hue? Correct! Workers dip wool into the mixture to gauge the exact hue of the dye. Almost done, my friend. Just one final question. Which body length garment was typically worn by women? Correct! A peplos was a body length cloth that a woman draped over her body and pinned around her shoulders. I had no idea you were so knowledgeable about fashion, but look at you. I should have known from what you're wearing. You've got it, my friend. Farewell for now.
Welcome to Amphipolis, traveler. The city of Amphipolis was the site of one of the more unique battles of the Peloponnesian War. Two generals, the Athenian Cleon and the Spartan Brasidas, fought for this land in an effort to control the resources it provided. In the end, though, neither got what they wanted. Look for me when you finish your visit, and we can speak of what you've learned. Welcome to Amphipolis, traveler. The Battle of Amphipolis was surely an interesting one. One might even call it anticlimactic. But that does not mean it wasn't important in the greater scheme of the Peloponnesian War. The city of Amphipolis was the site of one of the more unique battles of the Peloponnesian War. Two generals, the Athenian Cleon and the Spartan Brasidas fought for this land in an effort to control the resources it provided. In the end, though, neither got what they wanted. Look for me when you finish your visit, and we can speak of what you've learned. The land that would come to be known as Amphipolis was originally part of Thrace, a region inhabited by formidable semi-nomadic horsemen. Thrace was rich in gold and silver mines. It was surrounded by lush forests, making it very attractive to outside parties like Greece and Persia. By 513 BCE, Persia had managed to conquer much of Thrace. But after their defeat in 479 BCE, Athens made a play for the land. They conquered the nearby island of Thasos in 465 BCE. But the military prowess of the Thracian riders kept them out of the country's interior. It was only in 436 BCE that Athens established a solid foothold in Thrace with the founding of Amphipolis, a city on the banks of the river Strymon.
During the Peloponnesian War, the Spartan general Brasidas sought a way to subvert Athenian power across the Greek world. He set his sights on capturing the coast of Thrace, hoping to seize the resources the area provided. Brasidas knew that many of the Greeks living in Thrace hated the greed and brutality of their Athenian neighbors and decided to take advantage of the situation. He set off on an expedition to Amphipolis, accompanied by 1,000 hoplites and 700 helots, and arrived before the city in the winter of 424 BCE. At Amphipolis's ramparts, Brasidas announced that he preferred to take the city peacefully and promised to allow safe passage to any inhabitants who wished to leave, in addition to sparing those who wanted to cooperate. This proposal was well received by the city's residents, and he was able to capture Amphipolis without striking a single blow. Brasidas's march on Amphipolis blindsided the Athenians. By the time they heard the news and dispatched the general Thucydides to defend Amphipolis, Brasidas had already rallied several nearby cities to help him defend the region from Athens' so-called tyranny. After half a day's journey from Thasos, Thucydides arrived at the port of Aeon, but was unable to retake Amphipolis. Athens held Thucydides responsible for the loss of Amphipolis and forced the general into exile. In spite of Brasidas' achievements, Sparta did not send him reinforcements, which forced the general to negotiate a truce with Athens to hold on to the ground he gained. The matter of how to deal with Amphipolis divided Athens. The politician Nicias, as well as the city of Sparta, hoped that peace could be negotiated. However, the popular Athenian statesman and general Cleon wanted to continue fighting the war. Indecision continued until 422 BCE, when Cleon was elected as one of Athens' strategists. This decision made it clear that the city's people were in favor of war. The truce was ended, and Cleon began his journey to Amphipolis, retaking small towns that had been conquered by Brasidas along the way. On arriving at the port of Aeon, Cleon requested troops from the king of Macedonia. He also hired several Thracian mercenaries to bolster his forces' numbers. Afterwards, all Cleon could do was wait for the remainder of his reinforcements. While they waited, the Athenian forces began to resent Cleon's hesitation to attack. They saw him as soft and incompetent, especially compared to their opponent, Brasidas. Sensing the tension, Cleon decided to act without waiting for reinforcements to arrive. He set out from the port of Aeon to observe Amphipolis, setting up a camp on a nearby hill. To Cleon's surprise, Amphipolis appeared to be completely unprotected, with no guards stationed at the city's gates and ramparts. However, the city's lack of protection was only an illusion. Even so, upon seeing this, Cleon regretted that he did not bring wooden towers, which would have allowed him to easily recapture the city.
Brasidas positioned his own troops in a nearby wooded area to get a better view of Cleon's army. When the Athenians began moving to set up camp, Brasidas returned to Amphipolis. He believed his army was less well-trained than the Athenians and decided to rely instead on cunning tactics and Cleon's inexperience as a military leader. Brasidas organized a two-prong attack. He would personally lead a small raid, then one of his lieutenants would follow up with a second attack shortly after, disorienting the enemy. He had barely finished formulating his plan when he saw Cleon's army pack up and retreat back towards the coast. The cowardly display made Brasidas realize that perhaps victory would be easier than he thought. After seeing Brasidas' troops return to Amphipolis, Cleon decided to fall back to the port of Aeon and once again wait for reinforcements. Unfortunately, his exact orders were confusing and contradictory, which left the Athenian forces in disarray. Brasidas took advantage of this confusion and began his attack. Cleon's forces panicked, which made them easy prey for the Spartans. 600 Athenians were killed, while the Spartans only lost seven men. Cleon's remaining forces took refuge in Aeon, where the bodies of their comrades were eventually returned to them, though only after being stripped of their weapons. During the pitched battle between the Spartans and the Athenians, both Brasidas and Cleon were killed. The reports of their respective deaths reflect how they were perceived as military leaders. We know almost nothing about Cleon's death, other than that he was killed by a Thracian soldier. Brasidas, meanwhile, survived long enough to be taken back to Amphipolis, where he was informed of his victory. He was buried inside the city, which was considered an honor bestowed only upon heroes and was celebrated as the true founder of Amphipolis. The Battle of Amphipolis temporarily put an end to the hostilities between Athens and Sparta. The Athenian forces returned to Piraeus, while Sparta called back the reinforcements they'd sent for Brasidas. The death of both Brasidas and Cleon encouraged the two cities to push for peace. The negotiations took time, but Sparta and Athens eventually agreed to return to the way things were before the Peloponnesian War. The resulting treaty became popularly known as the Peace of Nicias. Throughout the Greek world, it was mostly agreed that Sparta had lost the war, in spite of Brasidas' heroic efforts.
The sentiment was rooted in the fact that Sparta had failed to end Athens' domination over Greece, something they had promised to do at the start of the war. I see you're done with your tour. The Battle of Amphipolis may have briefly put an end to the Peloponnesian War, but the so-called Peace of Nicias was only temporary. It would not be long before Sparta and Athens came to blows once again. Now, is there something else you'd like to do? Feeling up to a test? Then let us begin. Which Athenian politician wanted to negotiate peace with Sparta. Correct. Nikias wanted to build on the truce that was negotiated after Brasidas captured Amphipolis. Now for the second question. Where did Thucydides and Cleon arrive before moving to retake Amphipolis? Phaleron was one of Athens' ports. Try again. No, Bereaths was closer to Athens. Keep trying. Yes, Eon is where both Thugididis and Cleon's forces arrived before trying to retake the city. I have one last question for you. Amphibolis was located in which region? Amphipolis was not located in Arholis. Try another answer. No, Amphipolis was not in Thessalia. Try again. Yes, Amphipolis was located in Thraki. It seems there's nothing I can ask that you cannot answer. Congratulations, traveler. Very well. I hope you enjoyed your visit.
My friend, how fortuitous to run into you in this most intoxicating place. I'd offer you a drink, but uh, for some reason the workers won't let me borrow any of their wine. Chipskates. You know, I once started my own wine business on course. It uh, hit a bit of a snag when my investors, three brothers calling themselves the Cerberos, suddenly lost faith in me. But after they had a tragic run-in with a bloodthirsty Mystheus, I was able to land on my feet. From then on, the streets of Kos overflowed with wine, and my purse overflowed with drag me. Very sad about the Cerberus, though. Couldn't have happened to nicer people. As you can probably tell by all the grapes, this is one of Greece's many vineyards. Wine was an essential part of Greek culture, and this tour will take you through how it was made. In addition to being delicious, not to mention lucrative, wine was an important part of Greek economy. I promise I'll meet you at the end of your visit, my friend. See you soon! Winemaking dates back to the 4th or 3rd millennium BCE. It became widespread in Greece during the Bronze Age, and within centuries the Greeks had refined it further. The first step in the process was always harvesting, where grapes grown on rows of vines were collected by vineyard workers. According to Homer, harvesting was often accompanied by music to give it a more festive atmosphere. Ancient Greek wine mainly came in three different varieties, Osteros, Glucotion, and Autocratos. It could be flavored with spices, herbs, resin, and even perfume. It was also much stronger than modern wine, with an alcohol percentage of approximately 16%. Because of this, the drink was mixed with water to make it more palatable. Grapes were dried to maximize the wine's sweetness and prevent it from turning into vinegar. In most vineyards, the drying process involved laying the grapes out on the ground under the heat of the sun, then covering them at night to protect them from accumulating dew. According to Hesiod's poem, Works and Days, the ideal time to dry grapes was 10 days and 10 nights. When they were finally completely dried, the grapes were collected in jars, just as they are today. The Greeks had many methods for crushing the harvested grapes. The most common technique was to use a lenos, a large treading vat where workers stomped on grapes with their feet. Alternatively, the Greeks sometimes crushed the grapes by hand using a strainer, mashed them with a mortar and pestle, or squeezed them using a tool called a sack press.
the grapes were pressed, the resulting juice was poured into large containers called pithoi, where it fermented. Once fully fermented, the wine was filtered through an ethmos, or sac, which separated it from the residual yeast called lees. The wine was then placed in a special storage room. The room was half buried to keep it dry and maintain a consistent temperature of 15 degrees Celsius. These measures ensured the wine wouldn't lose any of its quality before being shipped to market. When the wine was ready to ship, it was poured into storage containers called amphoras. These were smaller than pithoi, which made them easier to ship and display in crowded marketplaces. However, that doesn't mean transporting wine was always a safe endeavor. Sometimes ships carrying amphoras as cargo would be wrecked before making it to their destination, losing hundreds of bottles of wine to the sea. Are you drunk with knowledge? I hope you enjoyed yourself learning about all the picking, stomping, and bottling that goes into making Greece's favorite beverage. Maybe if my customers understood how hard winemaking was, they'd agree more with my perfectly reasonable prices. But let's talk about something else, yes? What else can I do for you? You want your intelligence tested? Well, let me tell you, my friend, no one is more qualified for that task than me. Let's get started. What container was used to ship wine to the market? No, pithy were the big containers with the juice fermented into wine. But I'm fond of second, third, even fourth chances. So try another answer. Yes. Wine was stored in Amphoris during its long journey to market. Here's another question. Which of the following wasn't a type of wine variety? No, Afstiros was a dry kind of wine. Try again. No, Aftokrator was wine of the medium sweet variety. But don't give up yet. Correct! Thassos was an island famous for its vineyards, not a specific type of wine. Just one more question to go, my friend. Which part of the winemaking process created the grape juice necessary for wine? That's the one! The harvested grapes were pressed in a linos, often by the feet of vineyard workers. Just try not to think about that last part whenever you have a cup of wine. You know your wine. You're as good with facts as I am with money. And that's really saying something. If you say so, my friend, I hope we see each other again soon.
my friend. I see you followed your nose to this lovely uh, perfumery, perfume yard, perfactory? Yes, let's go with perfactory. A word of advice from a former perfume peddler. Never start your sales pitch with, you smell like you could use some perfume. It has a surprisingly low success rate. This sensuous little island is where perfume was produced. Your nostrils are in for a treat, unless you're allergic, in which case I could sell you a wonderful remedy for a very reasonable price. No? Okay, then. I'll check in on you at the end of your visit. See you soon, my friend. Perfume-making techniques were invented and perfected in Mesopotamia and Egypt, beginning in the 4th millennium BCE. By the time of the Mycenaean era, perfume played an important role in the Greek economy. Mostly reserved for kings, priests, and aristocrats in the beginning, it later became more widely available during the classical and Hellenistic periods. Greeks used perfume for more than just personal cosmetics. It also had sacred uses. For example, cults would sometimes anoint their god's statue with perfume, and it was also used during rituals like weddings and funerals. Food and wine could also be scented with perfume to add to a meal's presentation. The art of making perfume was part of medicine and pharmacology, and physicians devoted entire books listing the best perfume recipes. Perfume is made up of two main components. A greasy substance, called an excipient, like vegetable oil or animal fat, and an odorous substance, such as flowers and plants. For ancient Greeks, the most common excipient was olive oil. According to Theophrastus, however, the most valuable oils were those extracted from nuts in the Syrian and Egyptian deserts. The odorous ingredient could be taken from a variety of sources. These include flowers like roses or lilies, herbs like oregano, spices like saffron, resins like amber, and leaves from plants. Some fragrances were also imported from outside of Greece, like Indian cinnamon and Syrian frankincense. These exotic scents were considered exceptionally precious. Mixing scent into the fatty excipient was called enfleurage, of which there were two methods. If the flower being used for the scent was fragile, the preferred method of extraction was cold enfleurage, which required an oil-soaked cloth. First, the cloth was rubbed against the flower's petals, saturating the oil with the scent. Then, the cloth was pressed to wring out the scented oil. Hot enfleurage involved heating the excipient before mixing in the scented substance. The hot enfleurage process consisted of heating and distillation. After the scented ingredients were dipped into heated oil, the mixture was then filtered before being pressed and decanted. Once the mixture was complete, spices, coloring agents and fixatives were added, along with preservatives to prevent the perfume from spoiling. Finally, the liquid was hermetically sealed in bottles, ready to be shipped to market.
Perfume was usually bottled in ceramic or glass flasks, but more luxurious fragrances were contained in ornamented and painted flasks. Lekithoi and Alabastra were elegant bottles designed for women, while Arabaloi were used by athletes. It was common for the bottle's craftsmen to brand them to prevent frauds and knockoffs. Perfume shops were usually located in city centers, befitting of their importance. In addition to selling perfume, they were also sometimes used as meeting places. For example, the perfume shops near Athens's Agora were frequented every morning by the city's youth. The main purpose of perfume was to attract members of both the opposite and the same sex. We can trace this practice back to a scene in the Iliad, where Hera used perfume to seduce Zeus. Similarly, hymns about goddesses like Demeter and Aphrodite always mentioned their pleasant smell, further solidifying the belief that scent and seduction went hand in hand. However, perfume was also a mark of social status. Athletes covered themselves in perfumed oils during their training and at symposia, and citizens were judged based on how anointed, shiny, and perfumed their bodies were. Again, my friend, I hope you see now how important perfume was, not only for aesthetic purposes, but for Greek social hierarchy. I wouldn't charge so much for my own bottles if I didn't know the value of what I was selling. What else can Marcos do for you? Good idea. Let's start with an easy question. Which of the following is an example of an excipient? Yes! Olive oil makes a great excipient, and dressing, and medicine. Honestly, we pour that stuff on everything, including ourselves. And question two, what is anflorage? Correct, anflorage involved mixing the perfume scent into an excipient. We're almost done. Just one more question. In the Iliad, which goddess used perfume to seduce Zeus? Yes, Ira poured a saucy scent on herself to get her husband's attention. You did it! You've completed the test! If you say so, but I have a feeling we'll run into each other again soon. Farewell!
Welcome to Gnosis, traveler, where the Minotaur once prowled. Some say, if you listen closely, you can still hear echoes of the Minotaur's ferocious bellowing. Of course, it may only be a trick of the wind. Perhaps. Gnosis was the seat of the old Minoan civilization, where King Minos once supposedly ruled. These ruins have been the backdrop for many important events in both history and mythology. Look for me when your visit is over, and we'll discuss what you've seen. The island of Crete was first settled around 8000 BCE. Over time, significant towns and maritime trade began to develop. Palaces were built, destroyed, and then rebuilt, culminating in what archaeologists call the Neopalatial period, which began around 1700 BCE. This period lasted for over 300 years and is considered the golden age of Minoan civilization. The largest palace of this period was located in Knossos and featured maze-like complexes of workshops, temples, courts, throne rooms, and living areas, as well as paved roads and advanced plumbing and draining. Trade and external relations were important to the Minoans, and their networks extended across the Eastern Mediterranean. As a result, the people of Crete and the lands they traded with often influenced each other and exchanged ideas, usually through peaceful interactions instead of military conflict. The settlement of Knossos was established as early as the 7th millennium BCE. Today, one of the site's most notable landmarks is the Palace Ruins, located on the Kafala Hill. The ruins are split into two phases, the Old Palace, which has been poorly preserved, and the New Palace. The New Palace of Knossos had a surface area of approximately 13,000 square meters, making it the largest Manoan palace. Its focal point was a central court, which was probably used for ceremonial activities. The Minoan palace centers collapsed when Crete was overrun and conquered by a Mycenaean invasion from mainland Greece. However, the date of the final destruction of Knossos's palace is still unknown. During the new palace phase, the ground floor was dedicated to economic activities and contained large storage rooms. The residential quarters, which notably had toilets, were located southeast of the central court at the foot of the grand staircase. The palace was lavishly decorated with wall paintings depicting things like bull-related sports and richly dressed women. Large stone horns of consecration which were important Minoan religious symbols, hung prominently in the West Court. Other notable parts of the palace include the theatrical area, which is believed to have served as a viewing space, the tripartite shrine, which was dedicated to the worship of an important Minoan deity historians refer to as the Mother Goddess, and the Piano Nobile, a grand space located on the palace's second floor.
During his trips to Crete, archaeologist Arthur John Evans discovered several ancient tablets. They eventually led him to define the forms of Minoan writing known as Linear A and Linear B. The Minoans used these forms of writing for recording many things, including business transactions. For example, one clay tablet discovered at the Palace of Knossos was inscribed in Linear B script. The tablet detailed the transfer of coriander, often used in the perfume industry, between a man named Kyprios and another person named Twynon. The deciphering of tablets such as these has given historians great insight into many aspects of Minoan culture and society. According to myth, the half-man, half-bull Minotaur was born after Queen Pacify slept with a bull sent by the gods as punishment upon her. This embarrassed King Minos, but he could not bring himself to kill the Minotaur. Instead, he hid the monster in a labyrinth constructed by Daedalus. Daedalus was an important figure in Greek mythology, an ingenious inventor. He once became so jealous of his similarly clever nephew that he threw him from the top of the Athenian Acropolis. As a consequence, Daedalus was banished from Athens, though this did not prevent him from being able to get work. In Crete, he was hired by Queen Pacify to construct an artificial cow suit that would allow her to seduce a bull she was particularly taken with due to a curse from the gods. Daedalus complied, and his invention helped facilitate the birth of the Minotaur. Afterwards, Minos conscripted Daedalus to build the labyrinth, presumably as penance for his role in creating the Minotaur. But perhaps the most well-known story about Daedalus involves his son, Icarus, who used wings built by his father and flew too close to the sun, thus plummeting into the sea. Some time after the birth of the Minotaur, King Minos's son Androgeos was killed in Athens by the same bull that impregnated his mother. An infuriated Minos demanded that Athens send seven of their noblest men and seven of their most virtuous women to Knossos every year. After being carried to Crete aboard a ship with black sails, the men and women would then be cast into the labyrinth to be eaten by the Minotaur. One of the Athenian youths chosen to be imprisoned in the labyrinth, Theseus, had enough of the morbid ritual. Before leaving Athens, he proclaimed he would kill the Minotaur, then return to his city on a ship flying white sails. Before entering the labyrinth, Theseus met King Minos' daughter, Ariadne, who fell madly in love with him. Ariadne provided Theseus with a thread he could unravel to help him find his way back out of the maze. Armed with this thread, Theseus entered the labyrinth, killed the Minotaur, escaped the maze, and set sail for Athens with Ariadne by his side.
I see you found your way through the maze of ruins. The Minoans played a large part in shaping Greek myths, but also in introducing influences from other places and cultures. Now, what else would you like to do? You want to test yourself? Very well. Let's begin with a simple question. On which island was Knossos located? Yes, Knossos was located on the island of Crete. Time for another question. Which hero killed the Minotaur? No, King Minos had the Minotaur imprisoned instead of killing it. Keep trying. Wrong mythical beast? Perseus killed Medusa. Correct. Perseus slew the Minotaur, then escaped the labyrinth thanks to some thread from Ariadne. Now for the last question. What did Daedalus build for Queen Basithi? Yes, Daedalus made Pasiphae a cow suit, so she could seduce the bull she was cursed to love. Congratulations, traveler. You are a true student of history. Farewell, traveler. I hope you enjoyed exploring the ruins. Amazing. You have now completed all available guided tours. Congratulations on your achievement and dedication to knowledge. We hope you have enjoyed your explorations into the rich history of ancient Greece. Even though you've done all the tours, there's still plenty left to see. There are hundreds of world stations to explore, mountains to climb, seas to swim, and sunsets to watch. Remember that you're welcome to return to guided tours at any time and replay your favorite ones. On behalf of the Assassin's Creed team, thanks for playing the Discovery Tour, and we hope to see you again soon.